In the series premiere of Snowpiercer, the Earth got really hot thanks to global warming and wars. So scientists just decided, hey, we'll just cool it down. But that didn't quite work, and the Earth ended up freezing up. And there was really only one guy who thought, hey, maybe we should plan for this, and his name was Mr. Wilfred. So he decided to build the Snowpiercer train. A thousand and one car lengths that would continuously just circle the globe and never stop. The issue is... Pretty much everybody who had a ticket for the Snowpiercer train caused the global freeze, which left the poor and middle class to try to storm the gates and get on. And that's exactly what they did. Right before it left, they stormed the gates, were able to get on, and while security threw a couple of them off, the train left, wasn't going to open back up the doors, and the poor and middle class people were on the train in the very last car. And the show picks up six years later where those same people, nicknamed tailies because they're at the tail end of the train, are planning a revolt. And there's many reasons why they're planning this revolt, but mainly it stems from the fact that they're treated like shit, they're kind of used as slave labor from the rich anytime they're needed, and they're sterilizing the women. So it seems like they're just trying to kill off the tailies. And their rations got cut once again. And they're already divvying up their rations between the rats that they own and this guy named Big John who by far is the strongest and who's someone that they're going to need if they want to revolt. And the revolt is going to be led by a guy named Andre Layton, and he's very hesitant to just okay the revolt because three years ago they tried the same thing and they didn't know what cars were up ahead. And because of that, 60 plus tailies ended up getting slaughtered and 13 people had their arms cut off. So Layton just simply wants them to be careful if they're going to do this, but his hesitation has one of the tailies, a guy named Pike, wondering if he's even the right guy for the job. But they're running out of time, and like it or not, Layton is going to have to go along with the plan. And the plan is pretty simple. When security brings in their food rations, they're going to bum rush them, and that's going to tip off the revolt. So they have all their makeshift weapons, and they're just waiting to make their move. And one of the tailies, a guy named Old Ivan, ends up giving a weapon to Andre, saying, you can make use of this better than I can, because Old Ivan's one of the guys who had his arm cut off. And he also tells them that the car is really set up like a social class. The farther you get on the train, the richer it gets. And that's very true. I mean, the problems at the front of the train are like, there's an issue with the sauna. And the problems with the tail of the train are, how are we going to eat? And the only time anybody from the front of the train visits the tail is to give them food, and that's why they're planning on making their move when they get their food. But when the food arrives, a woman named Ruth from Hospitality is with them, and that's a pretty weird thing. And she makes an announcement asking Andre Layton to come forward, and nobody knows why. And because of that, Andre gives a signal to stand down and not attack, but he himself is wondering what's going on. And after an invasive physical, they give him a jacket that says sanitation, and they bring him to the third-class dining car. And when he's brought there, it's the first time he's actually seeing light in six years because the tail has no windows. And in the dining car, he meets a guy named Roach who is called a brake man, but really he just runs security on the train. And he's given a grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup. And after devouring the sandwich, Roach says, we know in your past life you were a homicide detective. And Layden looks at them and says, aren't you guys cops? But most of them weren't cops. In fact, one of them was a former soccer player. And the reason they want to talk to Andre is because there's been a murder. And they bring him to the body, and it's a guy who's been chopped up and his dick has even been cut off. But even after seeing the body, getting some food, he doesn't want to help them out because he feels like he'd be a traitor. He just wants to go back to the tail. He tells them, you guys figured out yourself. And the soccer player, Breakman, decides the best course of action is to kick the shit out of him. And when Roach sees that, he gets really pissed off because it's not exactly the way you get a guy on your side. And then Andre gets introduced to Melanie, the head of hospitality. And immediately Andre recognizes her voice because that's the voice that everybody hears on the train every single morning and sometimes at night. Anytime there's an announcement on the train, you hear Melanie's voice. And she's there because Wilfred wants this solved immediately. And she lets him know that doors will open anywhere his investigation leads him. And Roach makes mention that the same thing happened a couple years ago where a guy was chopped up and his dick was cut off. But they have somebody in prison for that. So either they have a copycat or they have the wrong person in jail. So Leighton thinks about it and says, I'll do it for rations and third class immigration for everybody in the tail. And Roach flips his lid saying that the passengers had tickets. The crew, they had jobs. You guys just bum rush the train. You don't have rights. And then Melanie is able to calm Roach down. She makes Roach uncuff Leighton and says, you're the only homicide detective on the train. And Wilfred is simply asking you to contribute. But he still hasn't agreed to anything. He is, however, taken to their version of a prison, where criminals are put to sleep, put away in a drawer, and looked at by a doctor. And the woman who was accused of the murder is a woman named Nikki Jeanette. And they want to wake her up, but the problem with that is she's been asleep for two years. And by waking her up, that would be the longest anyone's ever been asleep and then woken up. But since she was the only witness to the murder, they don't really have a choice. Roach then takes Layton through third class with a bunch of young people just screwing each other because he wants him to talk to some of the current suspects. And the first suspect that he sees is a woman that he used to date back in the old days, a woman named Zara. And she was currently dating the victim. And he's pissed off at her 
for letting them know that he used to be a homicide detective. But she says, it's just like the tale. There's no justice here. They could have pinned this on any of us. And the two have a very contentious relationship because he looks at her like a sellout and she looks at him like an idiot who thought he could use his cop connections to get them on Snowpiercer. And when that didn't work, they had to bum rush the train. And she didn't want to live in the tale and she sold out. And when she sold out, she fell in love with this guy, but he just got murdered. So after a quick chat with Zara, Roach takes him through a couple other cars that have trees growing and a bunch of fruit. And he's just amazed that they have 130 cars growing all this fruit and they can't share any of it with the tail. And in that car, he sees Melanie once again and says, you pulled out all the stops. I mean, you got my ex to talk to me. You got me some food and you just thought I would do anything, didn't you? But Melanie just simply asked for an update and he says, well, Zara didn't kill him. I'll tell you that. And I know that there's more to this because why would you be so desperate for my help? Pretty simple to me. You're worried that a murder will disrupt Mr. Wilfred's order. So if you want to keep eating your strawberries up here, you know my demands. Third class citizenship, rations, and the reproductive rights back. And that one he just added. And in a very complicated way, she tells him that he actually needs them more than Mr. Wilfred needs him. After she leaves talking to Leighton, she goes to talk to somebody named Jinju, who is making her some sushi. And she goes on to explain how they have to wake up Nikki. She also asks Jinju if she can help out the doctor with the process. And Jinju asks if Leighton has even agreed to help them, which he hasn't yet, but Melanie reassures her that he will. And once they find the murderer, Jinju can go back to her work. Now, things haven't gone great in the tale since Leighton got taken, and Pike has tried to take that leadership role, thinking that the reason that Leighton told them not to attack was because he knew that they were coming for him, even though that's not true at all. And a woman named Josie tells him as much. And Pike wants to attack, and the straw that breaks the camel's back is when old Ivan kills himself. And they kind of use old Ivan's death as a rallying cry. And the brakemen have to remove a dead body. So they open the doors and they go to remove old Ivan's and that's when the group attacks. And when they revolt, word gets to Leighton that they are revolting and he says, let me handle this, they'll listen to me. So they send Leighton in, but the group is very hostile. Pike especially thinks he's a traitor. Pike says, it's only going to end one way. And Leighton says, yeah, you're right. They're going to storm in here and butcher us. Leighton gets Pike to stand down by saying, I think I found a way to get us out of this alive. He then walks up to Till, the brakeman hostage that they had, and punches her in the face. And Pike and the others are about to once again turn on him, but he says, no, you don't get it. You surrender yourself. It's not that bad. They simply put you to sleep. Get put to sleep. Go in the drawers. He goes on to explain that he's been up 130 cars and seen things that they can only imagine. And because of the murder investigation, he can piece together security security schedules, and details about the cars. And at this point, Pike breaks down saying, we only made it one car, man, I'm, I'm done. But Leighton assures him that they need him up train, waiting in the drawers for the day that they take the engine. But when they go to turn themselves in, Ruth says, they're not going in the drawers. Mr. Wilford wants swift justice. So Leighton says, I'll solve your murder if you have mercy on the tail. And Melanie says, well, he will want justice in the sense of taking one arm but nobody else is going to die today. And after settling down that mess, Melanie heads back to her room, changes out of some clothes, and then heads to the very front of the train. And her and the driver, Ben, exchange a little chit-chat about the bumpy terrain they're going to be going through the next day. But as he leaves, he says, you have the train, Mr. Wilfred, because this whole time, Melanie is actually Mr. Wilfred. Episode 2 starts out the very next day where Melanie wakes up and opens up a cabinet and you see a picture of her from the old world holding a baby. And we don't know if it's her baby or her niece or a nephew, but it's there, she acknowledges it, and then she goes about her day. Where the train is shaking a little bit because they're going through that stretch of rough track. And at the speed they're going, they're triggering avalanches pretty much everywhere they go. And the one engineer is recommending that they throttle back 12%, but the problem with that is the train uses its speed to create electricity. And if you throttle it back, you have to enforce rolling blackouts. And that's something Melanie just doesn't want to do. He says, you can slow for safety or you can speed up for electricity. And she says, keep going the same speed. She then heads into first class where apparently word travels fast because they know pretty much everything about the previous day. But the thing that they're most upset about is the fact that they got a tally to be the detective. And Melanie reassures all of them that he was a homicide detective in the old world and he's simply the best man for the job. That same morning, Pike, Big John, and the others are put to sleep and Ruth goes to get that arm. And initially, she grabs a child who helped with the revolution. But the child's mother stands up and goes, no, take mine, because I allowed her to do it. And Ruth makes a speech about accountability, and then she wets the person's arm and sticks it in a hole out of the train. And with the wetness and the temperature being minus 100 plus, the arm freezes up, and then brakemen take a mallet to it and break it off. But as soon as they do that, she's not doing well at all, to the point where her son has to go suck off the soccer player brakeman just to get some meds. But he doesn't get meds. Instead, he gets drugs. And at this point, he's willing to do anything to take the pain away from his mother, so he gives him to her. And at that same time, Leighton and Till go off to do some detective work, and they pass by a bunch of sanitation workers. And Leighton definitely recognizes one of them, but he just simply doesn't say anything. 
The first stop they go to is to talk to the guy who found the body. And they go to the third class noodle place, which is apparently the best place to get noodles on the train. And he tells Layton how he found the body. He was going about his business. He popped a floor panel, and there was the guy. And there's a lot of people that pass through that tunnel, so there's a lot of suspects. They then head off to the scene of the first murder, a place called the Night Car. And this is basically a nightclub. But it might also be a brothel. It kind of has that lore about it. And this is a place where Nikki, the girl who was put under and being woken up, used to work, and this is where they found the body. And it's worth mentioning that Nikki is being woken up, but she is not doing well at all, to the point where they're actually worried that she's dealing with neurological issues. It's basically a worst-case scenario for them, and it's all from being asleep for so long. But back to the night car, where Leighton talks to the owner of the place, and she explains how Nikki was found in the room with the body, who was a regular of hers, but Nikki was all drugged up, and she thinks that Nikki was drugged up by the real killer, and Wilfred simply just wanted justice done so quickly, so Nikki got put in a drawer. Leighton then sees Zara, because Zara works there, and the owner says, I think he probably should experience what Nikki was doing in there. And he's always wondered what goes on in the night car. And while it has the reputation of being a brothel, it's not. You go into a room and you basically, through a meditation process, can kind of travel back to the way the world used to be. And when Leighton, along with Zara, does that, he travels back to the time where he proposed to Zara. And when they snap out of it, they immediately start banging each other's brains out. When they're getting dressed, she says she thinks Sean, the dead body, was an informant because they used to get all these perks, including winning the baby lottery. And usually if you win something like that, you have friends up car. And there's clearly something that they're not telling him about this case. And she was fully committed to having that baby with Sean. And Leighton, who obviously had a romantic relationship with her because they were engaged, says, did you love him? And she kind of brushes it off saying, it's Snowpiercer. But she does want Leighton to come back and be with her in the third class. And he says, I can't. I have a responsibility to the tale. Leighton and Till then head to the autopsy, where it's really a doctor. She's never done an autopsy before, but she knows her way around a body. And since Till in the old world wanted to eventually become a detective, Leighton allows both of them to try to figure out exactly what happened in the crime scene. And they do a pretty good job, but the one place they don't notice is who had the proper tools to cut off arms and legs. And it was the butcher. And immediately, Till is disgusted because she ate beef noodles that day. And Leighton is kind of implying that maybe Sean was cut up for food. So they go to visit the butcher, but he doesn't let them in because they're slaughtering cows that day. And he basically tells them, piss off, come back with a warrant. And as they're walking away, the train gets hit with a really bad avalanche. And everybody in the train kind of goes flying, including the butcher. And when he does so, he's got the item they have to kill cows in his hand. And it ends up smashing into the glass and puncturing a hole in it. And because it's insanely cold outside, everything in that one car slowly dies and freezes up. And I'm talking the people, the cows, everything in there. And now with the butcher not in their way, they head into the freezer to see if they can find those arms and legs. And sure enough, hidden in an air vent, there they are. And while Till is looking at them, Andre picks up a bobby pin and puts it in his pocket. And Till figures the case is closed. The butchers must have done it. They're dead. Pin it on them. But he says, no, that's not the case. Somebody was torturing Sean because they cut his dick off. And then they brought him to the butcher to cut the arms and legs off. They were clearly trying to extract some kind of information out of him. And she doesn't understand why he even cares. Just pin it on the butchers, get your third-class citizenship, move on. But he, A, doesn't want third-class citizenship. He wants to go back to the tail. And B, he cares because he's a cop. And she understands that because she wanted to become a detective and she was put on the first case and feels kind of guilty about what happened to Nikki. She lets him know how they had Nikki pinned out of the gate. It was a three-hour tribunal and she had no shot. So the search for the real killer continues. And while the murder is still a very big deal to Melanie, the bigger issue right now is that the train has a window punctured in it. And it was an extinction because those were the last cows on the earth and now they're dead. And they really relied on those cows, not just for food, but also for fertilizer and other things. And she gets Jinju and Bennett alone and they know it's a really bad situation. And to make it worse, water isn't going to flow in the train for a couple of days until that hole is fixed. So Melanie decides to ration off the water. Second and third class is going to get water for 15 minutes a day. The crops will continue to get as much water as they need as long as first class. And the tail, well, they're just going to have to make do with what they have. But the most important thing is that the three of them keep it to themselves just how bad the situation is. So as far as the rest of the training is concerned, it's just business as usual, just a little bit of a hiccup. They'll continue to press on, and they're going to pick new apprentices. And they pick those apprentices from the tail, and they pick three children. And one of them is a kid named Miles. And Miles' mother died trying to get on the train, and he's really been raised by both Leighton and Josie. And when he's picked, he has an hour to say goodbye to Josie. And the main reason that he's going is because he's heeded the advice of Leighton that they're going to need friends up train if they ever want to revolt. So he's going to go on this internship and try to make a better life for himself, but at the same time, not forgetting where he came from. 
And while Josie realizes this might be the last time they see each other, Miles says it won't be, don't worry. Now, speaking of Leighton, he's had a very successful day, but he's put back into the cell for the night. And he immediately tears off a piece of fabric from his t-shirt and starts writing down a note. He then uses the bobby pin to sneak out of the cell, and he draws a little symbol on the ground, and then throws that piece of fabric a little bit farther down the hallway. And the reason he did that is because he wants to get the attention of the sanitation worker that he saw in the morning. He figures these sanitation workers are just told to keep their heads down so he'll see it, and sure enough, he does. But Leighton needed to cause a distraction to allow the guy to bend over and pick up the piece of fabric. And unfortunately, the only distraction he can come up with is yelling, come get me. And he gets the shit beat out of him. But it does allow that sanitation worker to grab that message. Leighton is then brought in front of Roach and Melanie, and not really interrogated, but more chastised for what he did. She asks him, what do you see with this train? He says, a fortress of social class. And she says, well, I see the last remaining people on Earth living in order. And Mr. Wilfred is awake 21 hours a day trying to just keep the heat on for you people, but you're still not appreciative of it. And that's when Leighton, who is covered in his own blood, looks up and says, I guess that's why he needed Sean as an informant. Because Sean was a rat who was paid in perks. I mean, why else would you care about his murder? So what you really want to know is, when he was tortured, what Wilfred's secrets did he give up? She kind of smirks at him and says, okay, you're very perceptive. No wonder why Mr. Wilfred wants you as the detective on the train. But just know, that is literally the only reason why you're still here. Episode 3 starts out with Dr. Klimt describing to the audience how exactly Snowpiercer works. Painting a picture that Snowpiercer is really set up to keep every social class apart. And if you want to get further up the cars, you have to trade up to do so. Where for everybody, the goal is to eventually get to first class, but the game is rigged to keep first class really far away from second class. Melanie spends that morning addressing her crew with a, quote, message from Mr. Wilfred, because the last 48 hours have been tough, and it's encouraging them to just keep plugging forward. And in that speech, Commander Gray noticed that he paraphrased Churchill, which Melanie says, I'll let him know that you noticed. And he says, well, let him know that there's unrest brewing with the murders and the Taylor uprising. People are getting concerned. And she says, to that point, Mr. Wilfred is suggesting that we ease the mind of passengers. She then turns to Ruth and asks, can you move the fight night from next week to tonight? And then she asks Commander Gray to take control of the matter. And the fight night is a big deal because the winner of the fight is going to get an immediate boost from third class to second class. Melanie then goes to deal with Andre, who is sleeping in his cell and having a dream about the night that Zara left the Tailies. And you find out that Zara just couldn't deal with the lifestyle of the Tailies anymore. And even though she didn't know what the night car was, she was willing to take the chance just to get out of the tail. And right before she left, Andre ended up giving her his wedding ring, saying, take this, you can use it as a trade. But as she was leaving, she was getting crap from everybody calling her a sellout. You don't get any more of the dream because he's woken up by two guards who put a bag over his head and take him to a room with Roach and Melanie. Roach lets him know that if he tries to communicate with the tail again, he's going to stick his head out of one of those holes. Andre then asks, can I speak to the witness of the first murder? But, and they tell him, no, that's not possible. Nikki's not awake yet. She's still unconscious. He then asks, okay, well, what was Sean Weiss informing Mr. Wilfred on? And Roach lets him know that Sean was keeping tabs on the black market and letting them know about this new drug that is wrecking havoc in the upper cars called Cronal. And Andre laughs because that drug isn't new to the tail at all. It's been around for two rotations. And that comes as a pretty big surprise to both Roach and Melanie. Andre says, if you're looking for Cronal, just look for Osweiler the brake man. I mean, if you give him a blowjob, he'll give you a Cronal. And that's another thing that catches them by surprise. So that's what Roach and Andre do. They go talk to Blowjob Boy, and he's caught off guard in the dining car. And he immediately says he had nothing to do with Sean's death. And while that's very reassuring to them, they really want to know who his supplier is. But he says, I don't have a supplier. I was just taking confiscated Cronol, and the only person I gave it to was that woman in the tail who got her arm froze off. But right after Roach and Andre leave, Osweiler is grabbed by a couple of janitors and taken to meet with a guy named Terrence. And Terrence wants to know what they wanted, and he says, well, they wanted my supplier, but I didn't say anything. And Terrence is wondering how Andre was able to go from a murder to looking for Cronol. And Osweiler says, it's because he's smart. I mean, I really wouldn't underestimate this guy. And Terrence says, oh, don't worry about that. We'll give that cop a nice warm welcome. And then he kicks Osweiler out. Now, after meeting with Osweiler, Roach wants to go talk to Zara, even though Andre has told him that she had nothing to do with it. But he figures that there must have been something that Sean told her, but there wasn't. She says he never mentioned drugs. I mean, the closest he came to it was saying that he knew a guy who could get him anything he wanted. But even then, she doesn't have a name. Now, while Zara was getting interrogated, a few people in first class are a little bit concerned. And they're seeing through the fight night and the games as just a distraction from Mr. Wilfred from what's really going on in the train. And one woman in particular, a woman named Lilla, who has voiced her displeasure before and just seems like a real pain in the ass, tells Ruth this. And Ruth says, well, yeah, no, it is a distraction. 
but it's an entertaining distraction. And they're worried because while they've accepted the fact that this isn't a pleasure cruise, they feel like their fortunes have built this train, and now they're not safe because Mr. Wilfred has lost control of the train. I mean, we're talking first-class problems. And after they're done interrogating Czar, Roach breaks for lunch, and as he's eating, Andre's asking him about his marriage and if he had any kids, and he learned that he did have three kids, but two of them just didn't make it. And Andre feels like he can relate because he felt that loss when Zara went up train. He then asks Roach if he ever met Mr. Wilfred, and he says, yeah, I shook his hand a few times before we departed, but now he just speaks through Melanie. The two are interrupted by Till, who spent the morning with her girlfriend, Jinju, and learned from Jinju that Nikki isn't unconscious. She's actually awake, just not doing very well. And Till feels like she needs to solve this murder because she's the reason why Nikki is even in the drawers to begin with. Although Jinju warns her, do not cross Melanie. It's not a good idea. But with this information, she goes to Roach and Andre, and Roach, who is still on his lunch break, sends Andre and Till to go figure out what's going on with Nikki. Now, unbeknownst to them, Jinju has realized that she kind of screwed up during that pillow talk, so she gets in contact with Melanie, who is currently getting an update on the hole in the cattle car. And it's getting fixed, but at a very slow rate. And she's starting to get concerned because she can't keep pumping heat down there while these guys fix it. And Ben even suggests, hey, why don't we just get rid of the tail? But she doesn't want to go with that option just quite yet. So when she gets Jinju's call, she's a little stressed out, and Jinju says, hey, you don't want the investigators to see Nikki the way she is, right? because I'm pretty sure that's where they're headed. And Till and Andre have arrived in Nikki's room to find her in really bad shape. And when Andre looks in her mouth, he sees all this black stuff and knows right away that it was Cronol. All the while, the doctor is reassuring them that this is completely normal, but she was under for so long, she looks in this rough shape. It's kind of hard to buy that. And the group is interrupted by Melanie, who has arrived and tries to break it up, saying they're not supposed to be here, they need to leave. And both Till and Andre think that this is very, very fishy. Till then asks if the drug that they use to put people to sleep is some kind of Cronol. And Andre says, well, maybe it's the other way around. Maybe Cronol is a variation of that drug. And Melanie asks the doctor, that's not even possible, is it? But it is possible, and it's the truth. And this causes the doctor to come clean that Cronol is a street version of the drug that they used to put people to sleep. And a courier comes and grabs the drug from him, and in return, he gets stuff that he can use to help the sleepers that Mr. Wilfred just didn't think of. Stuff to help their bed sores, things like that. Andre then notices Miles' hair in a bag and freaks out and demands to know where Miles is. So they take him to Miles, who is flourishing in a classroom. He couldn't be any happier. He's got a bed... He's doing great in school, and Miles is really thriving in the internship. But their meeting doesn't last long, and Miles goes in for a hug and tells him he's keeping his eyes open. But now that he's seen Miles, Andre wants to go and talk to Josie and give her an update on Miles, because she's got to be worried sick about him. But Melanie doesn't allow it, telling him that Till can get her a message, and you'll be able to see Josie once you figure out this murder. Honestly, we can't even get down car anyway because of the fight night. And Andre says, well, fight night is a great time to see some janitor who's slinging drugs. So that's where Till and Andre head. They head right to the night car where they're hosting the fight night. And the first class passengers are watching it from above in the balcony, and they've noticed the arrival of Andre. And it just so happens on that night that one of the fighters is a janitor, so all the janitors are watching this go down. So the fight kicks off and Till watches the janitors while Andre goes to talk to Zara because he feels like Zara isn't going to tell him anything with Breakman breathing down his neck. And that was a pretty good hunch because it was dead on. Because when they get alone, she tells him that the one janitor over there is Terrence, and that was Sean's Cronol hookup. Andre wants to meet with him, but Zara says there's always a price with Terrence. She then takes off his wedding ring that he gave her and tells him how she sold her wedding ring, but she always kept his. And maybe he can use it in a trade with Terrence. So Zara is able to get a message to Terrence, but Terrence doesn't show up. Instead, it's Osweiler. And Osweiler lets him know that Terrence can't risk being seen talking to Andre. But Andre reiterates that he needs to talk to Terrence. So get out there and tell him that I need a meeting with him. Now, during all of this, Nikki, who has woken up in her hospital bed, has made it out because they're siphoning electricity and the lock on the door wasn't working for a little bit. And she's made it into the night car and is watching the fight. And Till has noticed her and is trying to get her back to her room. But LJ, Lilla's daughter, has also noticed her and is pointing her out, saying to everybody, look, that's the girl who was arrested for murder. What's she doing here? So Till's priority right now is to get Nikki back to her room. Andre, on the other hand, doesn't have to wait much longer to meet with Terrence. Terrence sends somebody to grab Andre, and they go to a private area in third class where the two can talk. Terrence tells Andre that he had nothing to do with Sean's death. But he does ask, how much does Mr. Wilford know about the Cronall problem? And Andre says, very little. In fact, I think if I solve this murder, he's just going to forget the whole thing, and they all have a good laugh about that. Terrence goes on to explain that the night that Sean was killed, he saw him with a guy from first class. A guy with a shaved head who takes care of himself. And the guy he's describing is a guy named Eric who is always standing behind LJ. Right before he leaves, he tells Terrence that he just needs one more thing, and he pulls out the ring and trades for it. 
He then heads back down to the night car, and he tells Roach and Melanie that he has a description of the guy, but is unwilling to give it until he can go talk to Josie. So they give in. They allow him to go talk to Josie, and Andre gives her an update on Miles, but he also tells her how he saw Zara, and he's had it wrong this entire time. He just couldn't see the great thing in front of him. And then he kisses her. But when he does so, he passes something to her, and that thing was a small implant that allows people to get from car to car. And that was the thing that he traded his ring for with Terrence. He's then forced to give the description of Eric, and Eric has had a busy night, because after seeing Nikki, he showed up outside of her room, killed the soldier that was guarding the door, killed the doctor... And then pulled up a chair and said, Nikki, you don't remember me, do you? But you do know who I am. Episode 4 kicks off right after episode 3 that night when Eric kills Nicole. And while that's going down, Bennett goes to visit Melanie because he's genuinely concerned about her. He feels like she's burning the candle at both ends. As both Bennett and Melanie are discussing about how she needs to ask for help, she gets a call, along with everybody else involved in the investigation, and they find out that Nicole has been murdered. So when I say everybody that's involved in the investigation, that includes Jinju, who is the agricultural officer. And she just so happened to be with Till, and they were discussing their relationship about going public, although there are social stigmas about dating up car. And since Jinju is second class and Till is third class, she's worried about it. And then there's Roach, who ends up waking up late in in the middle of the night to let him know about what happened to Nikki. So when Melanie arrives on the scene, the doctor is inconsolable. He's bawling his eyes out because he cared for these patients so much, and he kind of blames himself for what happened to Nikki. Melanie tries to calm him down, saying, we can make things right between you and Mr. Wilford, but what I need for you is for you to go get a gurney and some sheets because we need postmortem data, and nobody can see her like this. She then runs into Leighton, who is pissed off, because Leighton gave her the description of Eric that night, and she didn't do anything with it. She was planning on using it in the morning. And Leighton feels like this is on Melanie. Till then mentions that the border has closed. And basically what this means is the person they're looking for must be first class, but still located in the third class. And that's exactly where Eric is as he awaits for the borders to open up. So with this information, Melanie gets her group. That includes Ruth and Commander Gray, along with Osweiler, which Till is shocked he's not suspended. But Roach lets her know that they're short-staffed and he doesn't have a choice. And the plan is for Commander Gray's men to sweep up train, looking for any first-class citizen. But while they're discussing the plan, Leighton mentions that he needs to go to first class because they don't even know what they're looking for. And Commander Gray snaps back that there's no chance he's going to first class because he's a tailie. Melanie then lays down the law that Leighton will do whatever Mr. Wilford thinks is right. She then turns to Ruth and says, you need to wake up every first class passenger. And Ruth says, they're not going to like that very much. And Leighton speaks up, that's not very popular. You have a serial killer on the loose right now. Melanie, seeing the aggravation in Leighton's face, pulls him aside and says once they start the sweep up, both her and Leighton will head over to first class. And he says, is that your call or is that Mr. Wilford's call? Before they can answer, they both see Miss Audrey, the owner of the night car, and Leighton says, well, while we wait, I'm going to go talk to her. And Audrey lets Leighton know that if the killer's from first, there's only so far they're going to allow him to get in this investigation, and there's going to be no justice whatsoever for Nikki. Leighton's starting to wonder how third class is going to take that because all of the victims have been from third class. And he's worried about an uprising. He hints at her that he would like to use the fact that she's aware of everybody's secrets to his advantage in the investigation, but she says that's confidential. He then asks if Melanie Campbell's ever visited the night car and used the services, and she says, it's confidential. And if the answer wasn't no, she hasn't shown herself like that. Audrey warns him that he needs to tread carefully, but many people in third class do want change. And then the two are interrupted by Melanie. Audrey leaves and Melanie lets Leighton know that they're awaking the passengers in first class. Leighton lets her know that there's not a lot of faith down car that this is going to be solved because everybody knows the killer must be from first class and they protect the first class passengers at all costs. But she tells him, I don't care where the killer's from, I want it solved. So the two head up to first where Leighton is disgusted to see the art display that they have in first class. I mean, in the previous world, these are million dollar paintings. And she sees the disgust in his face and she tells him, take all of that anger and use it. Because first it's going to protect their own. So be their worst nightmare. So he does just that. He walks right in and says, first of all, I don't care who you are or where you came from. Because somebody in here has a thing for chopping off third class dicks. And LJ finds that hilarious, while the rest are just disgusted that a tailie is in their proximity. Leighton then goes over and starts eating their food and says, the thing is, I don't see everybody here that was at the fight last night. Where are the bodyguards? And nobody speaks up. So he says, I'll put it a different way. You've taken 14 arms from the tail. I'll ask again. Where are the bodyguards? LJ then pipes up that Eric didn't come home last night, and her dad mentions that he did ask to leave the fight early, and he wasn't there when they got back. And immediately, Eric has become suspect number one. Especially when LJ mentions that he had his gun with him. And guns aren't allowed on the Snowpiercer, except for the bodyguards in first class. And Leighton finds this amazing because the rest of the cars were disarmed, basically to keep the first class safe. Eric then mentions that he's going to need to see Eric's quarters, but Lilith pipes up saying that can't happen. 
And it has nothing to do with the investigation, she just doesn't want a tally in the room. And she's reached a breaking point and demands to speak to Mr. Wilfred, so Melanie walks over and picks up the phone and pretends like she's speaking to Mr. Wilfred when in reality she's just speaking to Bennett. And she paints the picture that Lilith being a pain in the ass putting up a fight about this. And when she goes to hand the phone to Lilla, Lilla backs down and says, fine, I'll allow him in our place as long as Melanie accompanies him. So Leighton goes in there and tears his room up to the utter disgust of Lilla and her husband. And he's able to find out that Eric was in the Marines and was hired by the family to protect them on their way to Snowpiercer. And he saved LJ's life from rioters as they headed to the train. He also had a rough childhood and as a cat. But while searching his stuff, he finds a blunt object that was used to harvest bees. And he's wondering exactly what it's doing there because the bees died off three years ago. So Melanie sends Till there to find out which bee atrium it was taken from. He then asks LJ, do you think Eric could have done this? And she says, ah, maybe. He sure wasted those riders on the way to Snowpiercer, and he always talked about having a mean streak. He then asks if Eric's ever gotten weird with her and aggressive, but she doesn't respond, asking him, is it true that you guys really don't get to see the sun in the tail? And since it is true, she likes to show off her remote control curtains and show him the sun. Melly doesn't give up, though, and presses on about her relationship with Eric, but she says, ah, we really shouldn't talk about it. And Leighton gives her a nod to basically leave the room so that he can continue to question her alone. So Melanie does that, but she goes out and starts questioning her parents. Now, while they're questioning LJ and her family, Eric has been found by Till and Osweiler in the third class, and he starts running. On his pursuit to evade getting caught, he grabs Jinju, who is just speaking to a guy in third class, and uses her as a hostage to get away. He fires a warning shot to try and get away, and it works. But not for long, because he gets to a point in the train where he is trapped, and he has nowhere to go. He has the gun pointed at Jinju, telling everybody to put their guns down, but instead of shooting her, he shoots a control box, hoping that that would do something, but it doesn't. They converge on him, and they kill him. And Melanie finds out about this as she's interviewing the parents, where you learn that Eric has basically raised LJ. They're very close. So when LJ and the family find out that Eric is dead, they're understandably upset, but LJ is really upset. And as she's crying, Leighton indicates to Melanie that it's actually LJ who was the one who killed people. So Melanie goes and gets a soldier to come in, and the family wants to know what's going on, and Leighton lets him know that Eric was nothing more than a dog being told what to do. And it was LJ who was telling him to hold people down as she cut their dicks off and slaughtered them. And as he's walking away, LJ snaps, grabbing that blunt object that was found in Eric's room and tries to attack him, but Leighton is able to wrestle it away from her and she's arrested. Melanie then makes an announcement to the entire car that the killer has been found and somebody else is in custody and everything is returned to order. As soon as she signs off, though, Leighton says, now Mr. Wilford has to deliver justice. Are you in charge of that too? But instead of responding, she says, let me go buy you a drink. And as they're both having a drink, she says, what do you think Mr. Wilford's big secret was? And Leighton says, I'll be honest, I just want to go back to the tail. But she tells him, you know I can't let you go back to the tail. You've seen too much. And you've also figured the secret out. And that secret, of course, is that Melanie is actually Mr. Wilfred. But then all of a sudden, Leighton starts choking because Melanie poisoned his drink. And Leighton collapses. Now, back in the tale, they've taken the chip that he gave them and used it. Josie volunteered to be a sanitation worker for the day. And while on their lunch break, she was able to sneak out and connect with a former tailie who has moved up to third car and is working in the food distribution portion of the train. So Melanie is able to connect with her and ask her for help. Because since Leighton is up car, she wants to get messages to Leighton and maybe she could use her as a go-between. And this is very dangerous, because if this girl is caught, she's going to go back to the tail, and she knows that, but she still agrees to help the tail because she feels that she owes it to them. So the group starts looking for messages through their food, and they end up finding one. But when they get it and open it up, it says that Leighton is missing, because Leighton has been put in the drawers by Melanie, who tells the doctor to keep it off books. Episode 5 takes place a few days after episode 4 when the tail gets message from Astra that she needs to see Josie again, which is going to force Josie back on the sanitation crew. But they think it's worth it because they need the information on where Leighton is. So during the sanitation crew's break, Astra meets him and right away tells them, I don't have any new information on Leighton, but if he's not in the tail, he's got to be somewhere. She switches clothes with Josie and tells Josie to head to the market and look for the yellow butterfly and meet a guy there named Terrence. He's the head of the janitor and I think he'll help you. So Josie heads to the market and is looking around for the yellow butterfly, but instead of finding Terrence, Terrence's number two finds her first. She brings Josie to Terrence, and Josie goes on to explain that they think that Leighton is in the drawers, but they're not sure, and they need his help. And Terrence is trying to make sense of the fact that the guy who just solved the biggest murder in train history would be put in the drawers. That doesn't really make sense to him. And Josie says, I don't know, maybe it's because he turned over the wrong rock. And Terrence says, well, maybe he's dead. But Josie says that's not really possible if you ever met the guy, and of course, Terrence did. So Terrence looks at his number two and says, you know, I think it's time we visit the drawers anyway. Can we get in there? And she says, yeah, of course. And all three of them head over to the doctor's office. As they go to get into the office, the number two pickpockets the keys off of the doctor who is leaving to go see this trial of the century, which we'll get into in a little bit. And all three of them get in there. 
Upon getting in, she throws the keys to Josie and says, good luck. And both her and Terrence go and basically rob the place. While Josie is left to try to find out where Layton is, if he's even in there at all. Initially, she thought that they were going to help her out, but then she realizes, no, they're just here to rob the place. And as they're leaving, they tell her, good luck, don't get caught. And it's all on Josie. So, of course, that trial of the century has to do with LJ. And that day, she's supposed to be put on trial in front of a tribunal. And usually the tribunals are supposed to be first and second class. So her parents aren't worried at all that she'll actually get convicted of a crime. But the fact that both victims were from third class leads to a pretty big push that they want in on this. And first class gets sent a message from third class when one of them arrives with a plate that is covered in cockroaches and shit. And this message forces Melanie to head to the night car and visit Audrey. And right away, Melanie says, I think that stunt was a little beneath. You. I mean, I don't really get this. One suspect's dead and the other's on trial for murder. What is your issue? But the thing that she's missing is the fact that Audrey thinks this trial is a joke because third class isn't involved at all when it was their two victims. And she points to one of the laws of the train that states that third class has the right to petition Wilfred in these kind of disputes. And Audrey wants a new tribunal drawn, including a third class passenger. And she can tell by the look on Melanie's face that Melanie doesn't want to do this. So she mentions the fact that Melanie used to want to make a difference there. Melanie mentions how she she remembers the day that Audrey pitched the night car idea to her and Wilfred. And Wilfred thought it was nothing more than a brothel, but Melanie saw the long-term plan of this thing. And she was able really to pitch Wilfred on the idea. So in a way, Melanie's asking her to stay out of this. And Audrey shoots back, well, we depend on you to talk to Mr. Wilfred on our behalf. So convince him, like you did with the night car, that third class should have a voice in this thing. And right before the conversation ends, she reminds Melanie that third class touches literally every system on the train. Melanie's thinking about it and at first she pitches it to Jinju and then she pitches it to Bennett and Javier trying to get their reactions on it and Javier is completely against it saying that the Folgers have a lot of power in first class and they can make life a living hell for everybody and if you think you have a social class war now wait till this happens Melanie wants to we'll use the term talk to Bennett privately she has Javier run the train and both her and Bennett go and bang one out real quick and it seems like Melanie does this with him anytime that she's stressed out because the last time they did something like that was when all of the bees died. But maybe it clears her head. Maybe she gets the answer she was looking for. Anyway, you'll slice it. She ends up giving in and accepting the petition and calling a third class member on the tribunal. So there'll be one first class member, one second class member, and one third class member on this tribunal. And this move is not popular at all in first class. And Lilla Folger is a little bit concerned, but Roger Folger reminds her that the first class person will get the second class person on board there's no way that lj actually gets convicted of this thing but that doesn't stop roger from along with a couple of other first class passengers going to meet commander gray because they're getting concerned of this sudden rule change and they're starting to think that because wilfred locked himself up train that he's a little out of touch with the day-to-day goings of the train but commander gray tells them that his job is to uphold rules not to make them they go on to pitch to gray that maybe all the day-to-day matters would be better suited to be handled up train where it's affected the most you know typical one percenters gray asks well, what happens to melanie cavill and roger says she would be the first to go now after this meeting what they didn't know was one of those people decides to go and rat everything out to Melanie, telling her everything that happened in this meeting. And she's very angry, but her initial concern has to do with Commander Gray and his reaction, although he doesn't really have one. He listened to what they said, but he didn't really agree or disagree with them either way. But she needs to get to the trial, so she thanks the guy for the information, tells him that the renovations that he need will be sped up because of this information, and sends him on his way. But she definitely has a problem, although she can't stew on it because of the fact that the trial is looming. Another group that needs to get to the trial is third class, and they've got Commander Till and Osweiler in the night car to take a couple of the third class citizens over to the trial. And Till has had a great day because she has been accepted on a probationary period to join second class citizens on the behest of Jinju. So she's in a great mood. And it even seems like her relationship with Osweiler is improving. Although when Osweiler goes to talk to the third class citizens, he does so in a way that just completely insults them and acts like they're not even human beings. And you can tell that Till doesn't really enjoy that. The two of them get the third class citizens together and head up train. And the last person to get ready for the trial is LJ, who has spent the morning being coached by her mother on what to say and how to say it. And Lilla is worried that maybe the trial of her daughter could be the spark that is needed to usher about change in the train that she doesn't want because it would negatively affect her life. So in her mind, it is imperative that LJ get off on this crime. So everybody heads over to the trial, which is broadcast throughout the train so everybody that's not there can hear what's going on. And the first person they talk to is Roach, since Leighton is in the drawers, he can't talk. And Roach shows them all the evidence that they found in LJ's compartment, 
including all the cut-up dicks. The second person they talked to is the person who did the autopsy, and she explains how all of the victims were cut up. The third person they talked to is Jinju, who talks about when she was kidnapped by Eric and how Eric was just transfixed on what happened to LJ and how to keep LJ safe through this entire ordeal. And the last person that speaks to the tribunal is Audrey. And she makes a plea to them that just because LJ is a first-class citizen to not let that muddy these waters, to not let her off just because of her social status, and to not let Nikki's name go in vain. They then have a break for recess, to which afterwards LJ will take the stand, and during that break, Melanie sees Lilla talking to a couple people and she tells her, stop, whatever you're trying to do, don't do it. But Lilla tells her a story about how when LJ was a toddler, she was lashing out and stuck Roger in the eyeball with a fork. And as he was bleeding profusely, instead of getting mad at her, he still decided to coddle her. And Roger ended up losing his eye over this, which to this day, LJ doesn't really think was a big deal and actually treats it like a joke, playing around with his fake eyeball. But the point of the message is that they will do anything to protect their family. And most importantly, they will do anything to protect LJ. So if Melanie Cavill is trying to come at their family... She better watch out. Now, after the recess, LJ gets up there and tries to paint the picture that she was forced to do all of this by Eric, but then says how she can still hear the screams of those men. And as she's trying to fight back fake tears, she mentions how Sean was an informant for Wilfred and that he made mention about how this beautiful train was being infested by these dark secrets. And there are 400 secrets that would rock us to the rails. And as soon as she says that, the look on Melanie's face is one of shock. And really, everybody in the know is shocked, including Bennett and Javier, who are in the front of the train. Because LJ just played a huge trump card in this whole thing. And as soon as her testimony is over, they break once again because the tribunal has to come up with a decision. And Melanie and Jinju go in a separate room, and Jinju goes, what the hell was that? Melanie says, I don't know, maybe Sean found out the drawers were experimental. Maybe he found a list. I'm not really sure. Then she writes a message and sends it to Bennett. Now, during that deliberation in the trial, Josie might have inadvertently found out one of the secrets, which is the fact that the drawers are experimental, because when she's opening them up trying to find Leighton's body, she's finding people that she knows from the tale, including kids and adults. Eventually, she is able to find Leighton's body and ends up triggering something to wake him up, but because of the fact that she doesn't really know how to do it correctly, he ends up convulsing. And she doesn't really have time to fix it because both Till and Osweiler, who are making their rounds, see that the door is open to the doctor's office and head on in, which forces Josie into the drawer with Leighton. But because of the fact that he's convulsing, they end up hearing this and open up the drawer to find Josie lying on Leighton. Now, Till's initial reaction is, what the hell is Leighton doing in there? But Osweiler's initial reaction is, good, I can beat on a tailly. And as he starts to try to beat on Josie, he gets cracked in the head by Till, who knocks him out. Because Till knows how much Leighton did for that case and doesn't know or think he deserves to be in the drawers. So both her and Josie end up dragging his unconscious body over to Zara's piece of the train, and they have her take care of him. Where he's slowly trying to wake up, although waking up people from the drawers is a very dangerous process. And the whole time while he's under, he is dreaming about the time that they had to deal with the cannibalism in the tale, which is a very unsettling dream. Although, he does eventually wake up. The tribunal, however, does come to a decision, and that decision is that LJ Folger is guilty of all charges. But as soon as the verdict is read, Bennett sends on a message to Melanie, pretending that he is Mr. Wilfred, that says that because of her age, he is overturning the conviction and allowing her to go back to her parents. And of course, this is a huge deal, because all the euphoria that Third Class had when the conviction came out is washed away with just disgust about the fact that this first-class citizen gets off. But Melanie felt like she had no choice because clearly LJ knows the secrets of the train. And right before she releases LJ back to her parents, she tries to get those secrets out of her, but LJ is unwilling to give it to her. She is willing to give it to Mr. Wilfred, but of course we know there is no Mr. Wilfred. And before she goes back to her parents, she does say that because of the fact that Mr. Wilfred was looking out for her, she's going to look out for Mr. Wilfred's interest by not revealing these secrets to the train. And then the little psychopath is released back into her parents' arms. In episode 6, there's an issue in one of the cars after a breaker box malfunctions, and Javi and Bennett get an alert in the front of the car. But Javi is more concerned with giving Bennett shit because he's sleeping with Melanie. According to the rules, there are supposed to be no fraternization, but it's been seven years and Bennett says, time to get over it. Melanie, meanwhile, is trying to do yoga with Jinju, but she's just not really feeling it. Because her main concern right now is that third class is planning on going on strike because of the Nikki trial. They're going to put all their tools down and just stop working. And Jinju makes mention that they're going to be hurt the most by this, and they don't even realize it. Either way, Melanie's planning on stopping it. She then asks Jinju how her night went with Till because it was supposed to be Till's first night in second class, but Jinju says it didn't. She never came home. 
And, of course, she never came home because she's dealing with the whole thing where she thought she killed her partner, but her partner was gone. So she was looking for Osweiler the entire night. Who, coincidentally, she does find. And very unlike Osweiler, he seems okay with what happened and is more concerned with going and doing police work about the third class uprising. Melanie then heads to third class, and they are booing the shit out of her. She makes an announcement on the behest of Wilfred that he has found out about the work stoppage, and she wants to remind everybody that they are on the train to work. That is their ticket. But they remind her that there are way more of them than her, her men, first class passengers. They outnumber them. Although anybody that speaks up starts getting beaten on by the brakemen. She realizes that she's got to get out of there, but before she does, she says that if they do plan on going on with this work stoppage, then she's going to take 10 random third-class passengers and put them back in the tail. She's then going to replace them with 10 tailies. And if they think they have it bad now, wait till they get in the tail. Now, one of the people that was overhearing this speech was Layton, who's trying to make sense of exactly how he got into Zara's place. She explains how he was taken out of the drawers and brought there by Josie, but she doesn't really know much more and wants to know how he got in the drawers. And he says he was put in the drawers because he solved the crime. That is it. Right after Melanie's speech, though, Josie shows up wearing Astrid's uniform. She tells Zara that she's got to get him out of here because if they find out that he's missing, they're going to come after him. And she thinks she's found somebody that can help them out. Right before Josie takes Leighton out of there, Zara asks them if she'll ever see him again, and Josie says, for your own good, probably not. Seems like Zara wants to tell Leighton something, but in front of Josie, she doesn't feel comfortable, so she just grabs a big jacket and gives it to him as a gift. So Josie starts helping Leighton walk through the train, because Leighton is in really bad shape, and eventually he just drops to the ground and says, look, I gotta tell you something. Wilford is not on this train. Melanie Cavill is pulling all the strings. She is the man behind the curtain. Wilford is nothing more than a myth to keep us in line. And that is the thing that got me put in the drawers. Now, you have to keep this to yourself because I'm telling you and only you. Nobody in the tale can know until we figure out a way to use this to our advantage. But there is no Mr. Wilford. It's all Melanie Cavill. While this news is completely shocking, Josie doesn't have time to dwell on it because she has to get Leighton to the person she thinks can help him out. And that person is Dr. Pelton. And she's going to help Leighton with the drawer hangover that he's currently experiencing. But one person that is not happy about this is Leighton because he doesn't trust Dr. Pelton. This might be the drugs talk though because one of the side effects of coming out of the drawers is being agitated and man does he fit that criteria he starts questioning dr pelton about who she works for what she does what her role is and she says that her role is simply to work on the people when they come out of the drawers at one point she does call them prisoners and layton snaps at her that they're not prisoners they're lab rats but she doesn't dispel layton's claim she admits that they're using it for prisoners but they're also using it for lab rats she compares it to their very own north korea in there she then shows them some passenger files everybody on board has one it breaks down your former work your health issues, blood type, really anything people in the train would need to know about you. But the other things that the file include are a red X. And Dr. Pelton isn't 100% certain, but what she thinks the red X indicates is that you're on a blacklist. There have been long rumors about this list that you're put on as like an enemy of the state, and Leighton is on it, Josie is on it, and as of two weeks ago, Dr. Pelton also had the red X. Now while Leighton is getting patched up, Bennett heads down in the train and finds out what's going on with that breaker box. And upon inspection, he finds out that it's affecting one of the brakes in one of the cars. Melanie meets him down there and assesses the damage and realizes that it's pretty serious and they gotta fix it. She heads to the school car and grabs Breachman Boscovich, who's kinda doing like a career day for all the kids. And she lets him know that he's needed down train. She also does a checkup on Miles, who is just thriving in his role as just, you know, being a kid. Melanie then makes an announcement to the entire train saying that there's been a mechanical issue and because of that, the third class train is restricted until further notice. And it's worth mentioning that this announcement broke up a conversation between Zara and Audrey where you find out that Zara is pregnant. But the bigger issue is in Dr. Pelton's office because when Josie hears this announcement, she knows that she needs to get back to third class immediately because Astrid's going to be waiting for her. But all Leighton can focus on is the voice he just heard. Melanie Cavills. And when Josie goes and thanks Dr. Pelton for all she's doing and goes to leave, Leighton takes the IV out of his arm and grabs her chip and starts running up train. And because she doesn't have the chip, she's at the mercy of people opening the doors on their own, and she gets to a point where she's on the other side of the cage from Leighton begging him to come back. But he says, no, I can't do this. I might never get another chance to go after her. And unfortunately, there's nothing that Josie can do, and he goes and heads up train to find Melanie Cavill. And thanks to that announcement, he knows where she's going. She's heading downstairs to assess the damage of that break, and before she does so, she's talking to Ruth about what's going on and the update with the break situation, but... 
Ruth's main concern is Mr. Wilfred. Ruth actually has no idea that there is no Mr. Wilfred, and ever since the trial went down, she's been concerned about his decision making. She kind of vents to Melanie about this, but Melanie just reminds her that she works in hospitality and chill out. She then heads downstairs in the train, and as she's walking over to assess the damage, Leighton pops up out of the shadows and grabs her and puts a scalpel to her neck. And boy, is she shocked to see him. He addresses her as Mr. Wilfred and lets her know that he is fully aware of what she's doing. If anyone says a bad word, has a nasty thought, they get thrown into the drawers. But as Leighton is making these accusations, both Leighton, Melanie, and everybody on board the train are thrown about because the brake that they're trying to fix has dropped and there's an issue. All of the cars are kind of thrown off kilter all of a sudden. Melanie then tries to scamper away, but Leighton grabs her and she begs him to let her go because the train needs her. She says the drawers aren't what you think. They're not a prison, they're a lifeboat. Because if everything fails on this train, your best hope is to keep people in suspension. We need a system to restart. The 400 people in the drawers were selected because of things like race, religion, skills, health. And it's all for the future of humanity if something goes wrong on this train. She tells Leighton that the train is dying right now and she needs to go fix it and Leighton lets her go. She reaches the crew and realizes that she will be the one that has to go under the train because Boscovich doesn't have the skill set that she has. And while nobody really wants her to go because she's in charge of the train, she's really the only person for the job. And unfortunately for her, she has 14 minutes to fix this or else they're going to reach a point on the track where the entire train is going to derail. Late, on the other hand, stumbles back to Dr. Pelton's office, where they are bracing for the worst. And Josie immediately wants to know if he was the one who did this, but he says no. But he did come back because he wanted to be with her, and the two have a nice, meaningful hug. Now, Dr. Pelton's office aren't the only ones that are bracing for the worst. First Class is bracing for the worst, and Till and Osweiler, who were in the prison at the time, are also bracing for the worst. And because everybody thinks this could be it for them, Till thinks this is the best time to tell Osweiler how she really feels, how she's not going to be extorted by him anymore, how she thinks he's a pretty much a piece of shit, and how she can't stand how he treats people. He then brings up her handling of the Leighton issue, but she says, you know that Leighton never deserved to be in the drawers. Don't you think something else is going on? Don't you always feel like you're kind of left out in the dark? Now, there is one group that is handling the whole situation better than anybody else, and that is the tail. The woman who had her arm frozen off a couple episodes ago has succumbed to the injuries and passed away. And because of that, one of the tailies has taken it upon herself to try to cheer everybody up by making a periscope where everybody can see the outside world. So while the entire train is planning for the worst, all the tailies are gathered around looking at this sheet that's projecting the outside for the first time in a long time. But at the final second, Melanie is able to save the train, keep it from derailing, and keep everybody alive. As soon as everybody finds out they're safe, euphoria erupts on all of the cars. Till and Osweiler get up to leave the prison, and Osweiler tells her, look, they're going to find Leighton eventually, and it's also going to come out what you did, whether I tell or not. Till then heads to Jinju's for the first time and apologizes for not being there last night. She visibly looks troubled, though, and says, what if I'm not the person you thought I was? And when Jinju says, what does that mean? She just brushes it off and says, you know what, I need a drink. Boscovich and Bennett then walk into third class and are greeted with ovations from the third class passengers who have completely forgotten about their strike. Bennett makes an announcement that it's going to take more than a little track turbulence to stop them and everybody is overjoyed because they're alive. And a chant for Wilfred actually starts up. As Audrey's walking out, Melanie tells her, looks like they had a change of heart about that whole strike, huh? And Audrey tells her, well, they might have had a change of heart about this, but their grievances haven't changed at all. And next time, you're not going to have a disaster to save you. But Melanie says, hey, Audrey, why don't you try reading the room? We're alive. Be happy about it. And then finally, there's Dr. Pelton, who has put up both Josie and Leighton for the night in her room as she shacks up with some other guy. And since there's only one bed, they both feel like it's a good time to consummate this relationship. And as they're doing so, the kid that they took care of, Miles, is summoned to Melanie's office. Melanie gives him a gift that Mr. Wilford gave her personally, but says, Miles, there's something I need you to do for me. In episode 7, Melanie knows she has a problem because Leighton has escaped and he knows the truth. She's talking to Bennett and Javi about what to do, and Javi thinks that they should just come clean, but she says no. He's not ready to reveal the secret yet. We can track him down. And one of the ways that they're going to plan on doing that is luring out Miles. During that close call with the train's brakes, they lost an engineer. And Miles would be perfect to become the new engineer. Even though he's extremely young, he's also very, very bright. So while he would be a good fit, this also has a lot to do with his relationship with Leighton. So when Leighton and Josie hear this as they get ready for the day, they know that this is a trap. But Josie doesn't have really time to discuss because she has to get back to the tail Astrid is waiting for. And Leighton is waiting for his ride out of there because he's still going incognito. So after Melanie makes that announcement, she starts trying to get answers as to what happened with Leighton. 
along with Jinju, she heads to the doctor who's in charge of putting people in the drawers and says, how could this have happened? When was the last time you saw him? He says, about two days ago, before the trial. He could have gotten out any time between then and now. He also says that there was some medical equipment that was stolen, and she knows that it must have been Terrence. So she calls him in and wants to know his relationship with helping Leighton get out. Terrence plays dumb, saying he has no idea what she's talking about, but when she threatens to cut off his hand, he admits that he did meet Leighton once, and that if he is running around, he's going to have to come to Terrence eventually, and that's when Terrence will grab him and bring him to Melanie. Melanie then heads off to figure out who she wants to interrogate next. Now, while Melanie was interrogating Terrence, Jinju was questioning Till. She asked, where were you the night of the trial? Why didn't you come home? Because Leighton's missing, and that seems pretty convenient. But Till lies to her and says, I don't have anything to do with it. It was just I'm nervous about this whole second, third class move. Now, during this time, Bennett has gone off to tutor his new protege, Miles. And Miles has been congratulated by his classmates and even given an orange. Bennett starts quizzing him about certain things, and it seems like Miles is nervous until Miles throws up. And when he does that, he's immediately quarantined. He gets sent to the nurse's office where Dr. Pelton wants to examine him alone, but Bennett doesn't want to let him out of his sights. So they come to a compromise where she's going to close the door, but she's going to lift the curtain up. So Bennett is watching the whole time, getting hit on by Miles' teacher. And as Miles is getting examined, he sees a familiar face. Josie because Josie really wanted to see Miles even though Leighton told her it's not a good idea she made it happen she apologizes for making him sick but it's because she wanted to see him she tells him that the revolution is going to start and with him being at the front of the train now he can be instrumental in it and he says I'm ready she then says there's something that we need you to do and whispers it into his ear the two then say goodbye and Josie is able to escape before she's caught by Bennett now her other half Leighton has escaped into the night car with the help of third class passengers and he wants to kick off this revolution but Audrey says what do you think I been trying to do he says bring me the key people that you trust i have something to tell them so audrey does that but some people aren't happy about it because they don't want to hear from tailies and they don't want to hear from him and he simply wants what they all want no rations no borders just everything's open and he says that there is a possibility of that happening some of them don't believe that there's even enough space but he says first class has a damn bowling alley there's plenty of space on this train we're not coming for third class's beds but there is enough space for everybody to coexist he tells them that he got thrown in the drawers for what he knows because he pulled back the curtain on the man in the engine. And some of them may already know what he's talking about, or at least had a hunch on it. The group then disperses, and it's just Audrey and Leighton hiding out in the back of the night car, and then in walks Terrence. Terrence tells Leighton that Melanie came and visited me today and wanted to know where you are. And I told her that if I saw you, I would hand you over to her. But at the moment, he's not going to play favorites. He does, however, have his reservations about Leighton's plan. Uniting the classes, it's not going to work. You guys don't have the numbers, so count me out. And then he leaves. Now, while Leighton was busy trying to get this revolution started, Melanie was also pretty busy trying to track him down. The next person she went to was Zara, and she tells her that she hears that she's pregnant, and that's great, but certain privileges can be taken away, i.e. her child. So, let us know who helped Leighton escape. So, with that kind of ultimatum, she agrees. And Melanie, a bunch of brakemen, and Zara head back into the tail where Josie has returned to and says that's her that's Josie and rats her out Josie is then taken into an office to be interrogated but brakemen aren't allowed in and that's just not really protocol Till is very surprised that Melanie wants to interrogate her herself and only herself Melanie and Josie start going back and forth and it becomes obvious to Melanie pretty quickly that Josie isn't going to talk she's not going to give up the location of Leighton so she pulls out a so she decides maybe torture will be the best method and she starts freezing her one pinky with liquid nitrogen and then breaks it now this wasn't fun for Melanie. She actually ends up throwing up because it made her sick to her stomach of what she just did. But while she's puking up her breakfast, Till wants to know what's going on, so she heads in there. And she sees what happened to Josie and feels terrible about it. And she says, how can I help you right now? She tells Till to get a message to Leighton. He's hiding with Miss Audrey. Tell him that I made contact with Miles and he's on board with the whole revolution. But Zara betrayed us. Till promises to get that message to Leighton and then Josie says, hey, one more thing. And that one more thing is freezing her entire hand. Now, before she heads back in to interrogate Josie some more, Melanie runs into Ruth, and it's Ruth's day off, and she's had a busy day. She got asked out by Commander Gray, and they had a really nice dinner. Seemed to be going well. It's Commander Gray's first date in about two years since his wife died. And while Commander Gray does actually like Ruth, that wasn't the entire point of this dinner. Because in walk the Folgers, and they question Ruth about management, getting Melanie out of there, and if Ruth would be interested in taking over if that happened. They think it's only fair that if they can change the rules for the trial, maybe they can change management. But Ruth, who is being a loyal friend, heads to Melanie to tell her what happened, but Melanie brushes it off. Off, thinking that it's just a minor matter something small like the food or the linens 
not an actual big issue like Melanie getting fired. So when Melanie just brushes her off and screams at her, telling her to just do her job, Bruce says, fine, and walks off. Melanie then heads in and sees the hand is completely frozen. But that also allows Josie to break it off, and now she's no longer handcuffed. She starts attacking Melanie, and Melanie is fighting her off. And eventually, the liquid nitrogen hose gets broken off, and there's liquid nitrogen just flowing in the air. So when Melanie is able to get free, she locks Josie in the room to freeze to death. When Melanie walks out, she's greeted by Commander Gray, who wants to know why she did an interrogation without him. But she doesn't answer. Answer. She just says, take her to compost. And that's when Till knows what happened to Josie. Till is able to get those messages to Layton, but also lets him know about what happened with Josie. That night, Melanie meets with Miles and says, if you're ready to do this, when you walk through these doors, you'll be an engineer. Miles asks her if she's happy being an engineer, and she says, the needs of the train are more important than our own happiness. We're engineers. We keep the world alive. So, with that pep talk, Miles walks into the front of the train. And while Miles was getting a promotion, Leighton was busy meeting somebody. In the back of the night car, where all the clients go, in walks LJ. At first, she's a little scared that it's Leighton, but Leighton says, I've been thinking about you and how much you like dirty little secrets. How would you like to know the dirtiest little secret on the whole damn train? In episode 8, Leighton has put the wheels in motion to get the revolution started. And it all kicks off with LJ getting signaled from her car, from Miles, who's in the front of the train now, to to come over and see for herself that there really is no Mr. Wilfred. And she does. She is blown away by the fact that Mr. Wilfred is a myth. And as Miles is showing her Melanie's empty cabin, she ends up taking one of the pictures of Melanie and her baby daughter for later. When LJ gets back to her room, she flashes some lights signaling that she did in fact make it to the front of the train and, and that message gets relayed to Layton, who is in the night car holding a strategic meeting about the next day's plans. And in this meeting, you've got Miss Audrey, but you also have Till. And in this meeting, Leighton lays out his entire plan saying that if all goes well, they'll meet the jackboots mid-train. And that way they'll be able to fight them on their terms. After the meeting, Till goes and talks to Jinju and says, I can't tell you why, but you gotta stay out of third class today. And Jinju wants to know why Till lied to her about helping Leighton. But Till wants to know why she told her to stay clear of Melanie Cavill. And Jinju says, it's because you're messing with stuff you don't understand. And that's when Till realizes that she knew about Leighton the entire time. She knew he was put in the drawers. And Till says, you were protecting her. And Jinju says, no, I was protecting you. Please don't make me choose between you and the train. But Till doesn't give her an answer and says, just stay in here today. Don't leave. The next day, armed with LJ's information, her parents, along with Commander Gray, call a meeting with Ruth. And they tell Ruth that they have inside info that there is no Mr. Wilford. He's not even on the train. And Ruth doesn't believe that because she has no reason to. She met Mr. Wilford once. That was enough for her. But she thinks this is ridiculous. But the Folgers let this information out and it's causing a commotion in first class. They radio to Melanie to head there and deal with the issue. Now, Melanie was at the front of the train, teaching Miles all about the train, how if the train stops, everybody dies, that sort of thing. So when she gets called to first class and sees all the people, she gets a little concerned. She gets even more concerned when Ruth tells her that the issue is they think there's no Mr. Wilfred, and they want to see him in person. Melanie tries to pull the same trick as last time. All right, well, I'll call him up. You can talk to him yourself, but that isn't going to work. They need to see him in the flesh, and that's an issue. They tell Melanie that they have inside info that there is no Mr. Wilfred. And she says, well, who's the inside information? And that's when LJ gleefully puts up her hand, happy to reveal that she is the person who revealed the deep, dark secret. Melanie tries to discredit her because LJ is a murderer, and a few of the first-class passengers agree with Melanie. And this causes a bit of a commotion between the first-class passengers, but LJ says, no, look, I have proof. I was in her cabin, and I even grabbed a picture of her dead kid. And when Melanie sees that LJ did in fact grab that picture, she goes after her, but she's held back by a few of the jackboots. But that tiny commotion that was caused when people started questioning LJ's credibility has blown up into a big way. And all the bodyguards are now going after each other and have to be held back by the jackboots. So that's when Commander Gray gives the order to get every one of the jackboots up train because they need him as security. Melanie tells him, you can't do that. We need those people down train. But he says, I'm done taking orders from you. He then orders everybody into their cabins and Melanie Cavill to be arrested. Ruth tells Gray, what if you're wrong about this? What if we go to the engine and Wilfred is there? And Gray says, well, we need to see for ourselves, so let's head up to that engine. And up at the engine, Melanie has been able to signal to them to shut down the engine, and that's a huge deal. And when she's able to trigger that alarm, Javi and Bennett immediately go into a frenzy, not knowing why she's doing that. Miles wants to know why would they shut down the engine ever, and Javi snaps at him, saying, I don't know, you've been here two days, you tell us. They then start hearing a clamoring outside of the door, and when Javi goes to look, he sees Commander Gray along with Ruth and a couple of jackboots and knows that there's a problem. And he wants to open the doors and just tell him the truth. There is no Mr. Wilfred. But Bennett yells at him that we can't do that. But instead of following Bennett's order to keep them out, Javi opens up one of the doors. And Bennett cannot believe that he just did that. Still clinging to hope that he can keep this lie about Mr. Wilfred going. 
He ends up punching Javi and locking him out of the actual engine room. So when Commander Gray and Ruth and the Jackboots find Javi, they start immediately questioning him, and he comes clean. Mr. Wilford's dead. He's been dead for a while. But Javi says he had nothing to do with it. And it's true. Ruth goes into the living quarters of Melanie and sees that there is no Mr. Wilford. And she cannot believe that she was fooled. She can't believe she's been lied to this entire time and can't believe that she's been such a fool not to see this before. And all she can think about is that Melanie needs to pay for what she did. Now, Commander Gray probably should have listened to Melanie when she said you can't draw all of the jackboots up train. Because that was all a part of Layton's plan. He's been able to get word to the tail that the uprising is going to happen today and to prepare for it. He then gets escorted by Till back to the tail, where Till does have to take out one of her fellow brakemen in the process. But when the doors open in the tail, they're all ready to go to war. But that anger quickly subsides when they see that it's Leighton. They're just so happy to see him, but then they start wondering why is Till here? And Leighton lets them know that Till is now one of them, and he even hands her a red armband that signifies to the tale that she's one of them. And then he gives an impassioned, riled-up speech to everybody who can hear it, that it's no longer one tale, it's one train. And today, they make it to the front. Now, another part of Leighton's plan has been to sneak a couple of tailies out and disguise them. A few of them are disguised as jackboots, and they're going to head to the drawers to wake up the tailies that were put in there from the last revolt. Another one is disguised as an electrician, and they're going to cut the phone lines. But after they do that, Osweiler ends up noticing that the electrician seems fidgety and then he notices that the other one is a tailie. And because the phone lines have been cut, he makes one of the other brakemen run up train to let Commander Gray know. So as Commander Gray and Ruth and the Folgers are trying to figure out what to do about the whole Wilford situation, in comes this brakeman who tells Commander Gray that the tailies have made it out of the tail and are moving up train. And Commander Gray knows that They've been squabbling about Mr. Wilford's situation, distracted the entire time. This is no coincidence. So he needs to get down train as quickly as possible, and he feels like the easiest way to do that is to use the tunnels under the train. So when Commander Gray leaves to go deal with the tail situation, Ruth wants some answers from Melanie. She feels betrayed and just wants to hear the truth. And the truth is that Mr. Wilford was nothing more than a guy used to sell tickets. He never believed in saving humanity at all. He believed in getting the easiest life for him with whores from the night car and a lot of booze, and that's it. And it was actually Melanie who built the train, not Mr. Wilfred. So if they had actually left it into Mr. Wilfred's hands, they wouldn't have made it one revolution, and Melanie knew that. So she left him on the platform and decided to take the train over. Melanie assures her that the friendship that they had was real and apologizes for lying to her. And Ruth takes this all in and tells her that you're a filthy liar and a murderer, and tomorrow you're going to be executed for what you did, for betraying Snowpiercer. And then she leaves. At this point, back in the tale, though, Layton, Till, and the rest of the tailies have made it to third class, where Roach and the Brakeman are waiting for them. Now, Layton doesn't want to go to war with the Brakeman, so him and Till end up going up and trying to see if they can reason with Roach. And Roach tells them that this crap that they're spewing about there being no Mr. Wilford is ridiculous and no one's going to buy it. And Layton tells him, along with the rest of the third class passengers who are watching all this go down, that it is true. There is no Mr. Wilford. And first class just found out about it now. And it's only a matter of time before third class finds out about it. And because there is no Mr. Wilfred, someone's going to have to run this train. And since third class and the tail already kind of make this train go to begin with, it might as well be one of them. So let's work together instead of going to war now. They beg Roach to move over and just let them pass through. And it seems like they talk a lot of sense in a Roach because he gives the order to stand down and they let the tailies move on through. The jackboots, though, are on their way in the tunnels, but Leighton's already thought of that. And he sent a couple of tailies down along with this catapult-like weapon to take them out. And boy, does that ever work. Because Commander Gray, seeing that it's going to be tough to just bully their way through it, leaves half of his soldiers in the tunnels, but the other half he takes upstairs to just catch them head on that way. And they end up meeting in the night car, where Leighton's plan has worked. They've drawn in all of the jackboots along with Commander Gray and kind of trapped them there, where they have the element of surprise. And in the night car, a bloody, vicious battle goes down. I mean, both sides are suffering casualties left and right, but it seems like Leighton's crew ends up getting the best of Gray's because Gray gives the order to retreat. Shortly after Commander Gray's troops leave, Leighton, along with the rest of the third-class members and the tailies, are just looking at all the casualties go down, tending to the injured. When some of the jackboots come back and throw a bunch of smoke bombs down in the night car and forces Leighton and his crew to go to the third-class cafeteria. As Commander Gray is walking back up to first class to regroup, he passes by the room with the drawers. And Leighton's guys, who are dressed as jackboots, have been able to wake up two of the members, one of whom is that ridiculously big, strong guy that didn't talk. And when he woke up from the drawers, 
he was speaking Mandarin. To which the doctor said, does he speak Mandarin? And the tailie said, dude, he doesn't speak at all. But with the fighting going on, they were waiting for some reinforcements from the tail that never showed up. And the doctor says, where are your people? And the tailie says, I have no idea. The doctor, getting nervous, says, we should just leave now. Come back for the sleepers later. But the tailie says, no, we're not doing that. And then he goes over to wake up the last person from the last revolt. And that's Pike. But when they open the drawer... Pike is gone, to everybody's shock, and the tailies are looking at the doctor for some answers. Now, Pike has been woken up by Commander Gray and the rest of the first class passengers to get some answers and info on Leighton. And Pike, who never really got along with Leighton in the first place, is happy to give it because he's getting all the amenities of first class at the moment. And he tells him that Leighton is a good cop, but he doesn't have the stomach for sustained cruelty, so if you keep grinding on him, he's going to crumble. And you can kind of see that in the third-class dining car as Leighton is looking over all of the casualties and the injured, and he feels really uncomfortable because he lost a ton of people that day, a lot of whom were his friends. And you can see the doubt start creeping in his mind of if he made the right decision by lighting this match on the revolution. Episode 9, the first class is figuring out their next move, and they're all kind of torn on their priorities. Commander Gray lets them know that the plan is to gas out most of the third class and the tailies, and one of the people brings up, how do you not gas out civilians? But Commander Gray's not even thinking of that. They're just going to be a casualty. Javi, who is now working with first class, thinks this is a terrible idea, knowing that they need workers, but Lila Folger says, well, we're overpopulated anyway, and we'll just train new people. So that's one priority. The other priority is with Ruth, because she wants to make the execution of Melanie Cavill a public thing, to where then they can hand over the train to whoever's going to take it over. But Lila Folger says, well, if we don't figure out what to do about the tailies in the third class, we're not going to have a train to hand over. They're basically at the gate right now. So you can see that there's definitely signs of a power struggle going on, and part of that power struggle involves Commander Gray, who takes Javi to the front of the train to get him at the engine, but Javi can't get in. He tells him that Bennett is loyal to Melanie and will hold off as long as he can. Javi says, well, maybe we don't have to gas everybody if Leighton gives himself up. But Gray kind of laughs that off and threatens Javi's job if he doesn't get them inside. So Javi says, I'll go to the back of the train and override the system. Commander Gray then runs into Ruth, who is in Melanie's cabin, and is absolutely amazed at the lengths that Melanie went to keep the Mr. Wilford situation under control. The fact that she had his journals, the fact that she had voice recordings of him so that she could doctor the announcements. I mean, she's amazed. And this is kind of turning Gray on a little bit. And he pitches to her the idea that both Ruth and Commander Gray could then take over the train. And since power is nature's most powerful aphrodisiac, she ends up kissing him. She loves that idea. The rest of the power struggle comes from the Folgers who want to be in charge and the rest of the people who don't want to see them in charge and are going to great lengths to make sure that they aren't ever in charge. Now, Javi had mentioned Leighton surrendering, and that wasn't just a thought. The first class has sent Pike back to third class to talk to Leighton about surrendering, giving him the option that if he surrenders, they won't gas anybody. But if he stays in fights, they're going to go car to car, scorched earth, killing everybody. So while it seems like a pretty easy choice, Leighton's on the fence about it, and Pike gives him an hour to decide. So Leighton goes and talks to Audrey and Till about it, and Audrey says, well, even if you turn yourself in, it's not going to end with you. And both of them urge him not to surrender. Before Leighton leaves the car, Audrey pulls him aside and says, you have to talk to Zara. So Leighton reluctantly does so. He hears Zara's side of things about the Josie situation, and she apologizes, and Leighton's still very standoffish to her, until she brings up the fact that she did it for her baby, and she did it for their baby. And then she grabs Leighton's hand and puts it on her stomach. And when Leighton finds out that he's going to be a father, it changes his whole mindset. By not surrendering, he wouldn't just be killing random people that he knows, he would be killing his unborn child. And that is something he can't do. So he's made up his mind, and he sees Till before he does so, and Till wants to get ready to work, but he says, no, Till, it's over. And she kind of feels betrayed because she believed in him, but he's made up his mind. He finds Pike and says, all right, I'll surrender. So Pike heads to first class and tells him that Leighton has agreed. They will get Leighton's head, and the people in third and the tail will get mercy. Ruth goes off to tell the rest of the first class and the second class passengers what's going on, and Commander Gray heads off to deal with the surrender. And LJ goes to her parents and says, you guys should be there because these people are looking for a leader, and they're just going to think that Commander Gray and Ruth did all of this. And the Folgers agree that, If anyone from first class is going to step up, it's going to be them. Now, during all of this, Melanie Cavill is sitting in that third class prison with a lot of the people from third class in the tail who were arrested during the riots. And she's waiting to be executed. And the way they execute people is by freezing their lungs out. Seems like a very painful process, and Melanie's terrified. When her name gets called, she's waiting for the air to hit her lungs, but then Javi pops out of nowhere and saves her with the help of the woman who's set to execute her. That woman ends up stalling and giving Javi enough time to get Melanie out of there. Melanie makes her way through the ventilation system and finds her way to third class, where Leighton's about to turn himself in, 
But Melanie says, you're going to want to hear me out. I can get you the train. Because Snowpiercer isn't going to survive with Commander Grey or the Folgers in charge. And her plan is to disconnect a certain section of the train that is full of jackboots at a precise time when the track is going to split. Bennett would switch the track over so the front of the car goes left, the jackboots car goes right, and then as soon as they're passed, Bennett will switch the track over and the rest of the cars will go left. Bennett will then slow the front of the train down and the back of the train will clip in and they'll head off. Everybody in the jackboot side will die. And while this is very risky, it can be done if it's done at the right time. Till says, if what you're saying is possible, then we're just giving you an avenue back to power. And she says, no, if this works, I want to be in power. Leighton would. Leighton can't believe that she would just hand over power. And she says, it was never about that. It was about saving humanity. What do you want me to do? Say I'm a terrible person? Say that I did all these bad things and I'm power hungry? What would that solve? My way didn't work. Let's see if your way does. And since they really don't have another choice, they agree to go along with Melanie's plan. Melanie then explains to Leighton his role in this whole situation. He's going to be down train. And then she's able to radio to Bennett on a private radio that's rarely used his role in things. She then cuts out the chip from her arm that's able to open up every door and hands it over to Leighton so he's able to get through. And as she's doing this, they're interrupted by Roach, who has shown up thanks to Till. And he really just showed up because he couldn't believe his eyes that Melanie Cavill would be helping the rebels in this situation. But there they are standing in front of him. He asks, let me ask you, what happens if this plan of yours doesn't work? And she says, well, the front of the car is going to starve while the back of the car is going to freeze. He says, all right, just so we all know that this is a stupid idea. Let's go, and he agrees to help them. So they all synchronize their watches because once Melanie pulls the lever, Leighton is going to have three minutes on his end to do the same, and he's got to do it at the precise time. Roach's role in this whole thing is he's going to escort Leighton up train to be, quote, executed. And when they get to first class, first class wants to make a whole show of this with pictures and announcements, but Roach hurries them along knowing that they don't have a lot of time. When Leighton gets through the jackboots, they start roughing him up a lot, and Roach ends up finding a gun and pointing it at Commander Gray and saying, uncuff him. Commander Gray is able to get the gun away from him, and they get into a fight. And it's not going well for both Leighton and Roach until all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Strong Boy, who is out of the boxes and still speaking Mandarin, pops out and takes everybody out. This frees up Leighton enough time to get to his spot in the train that he's supposed to execute the plan. But when he gets there, he sees through the glass all of the third class and tailies that have been arrested. He goes to try to free them, but he can't find a key. And with time running out, he doesn't have a choice but to leave them there. And it's sad because a lot of these people are his friends, but he's got to do what's best for the rest of the train. So Leighton frees up the train and everything works. The jackboots go right, the train goes left, and they're able to reconnect. And people like Commander Gray and the Folgers, everybody except LJ, are left to die in the freeze while the rest of the train is freed up. When Leighton sees Melanie again, he's mad at her because he says, you knew that I would have to kill those people. And she says, I knew you'd have to make that choice. And those are the kind of choices that we have to make every single day as the head of the train. And then she says, but you have the train, Leighton. In the season finale, Melanie hops on the mic and makes a speech about choices, like the choice about climate change and her choice to pirate Snowpiercer and lie to everybody. And she's also making the choice to give up the train to the rebel forces, and then she leaves Leighton to address the train, where he introduces himself. After this initial announcement, Leighton goes to find Miles and explains what happened to Josie, and Miles is very shook up about it. He's crying, and Leighton tries to console him, saying how much that Josie loved him and loved Leighton and loved all the tailies, and they'll get through this together. He then goes to address First Class who are having their issues, and Leighton announces that the brakemen, along with some rebels, will handle order in the train for the moment until they can vote on a governing body. But most of the First Class is concerned because of looting. And while Leighton says, yes, there has been looting, we have it under control at this time. And as you'd expect, there's a lot of infighting between the First Class passengers and the Third Class slash Taylor group on who's to blame for all of this. And it's kind of led by Ruth, who is disgusted at what's going on in Snowpiercer. But Leighton says, we look to ourselves now. We're not putting anybody in any drawers. We're not taking arms. This is on us. He then tells them that you all are department heads and passenger reps. So the message is clear to all of you guys. The train is ours now. It's everybody's. And it's ironic because they're about to pass through Chicago where all of this started. And it's through Chicago where they'll kick off a new revolution. But Ruth isn't buying this and tells Roach as much, saying that a utopian society is never going to work on Snowpiercer. Now, one person who sees that looting firsthand is LJ, who walks into her first-class cabin to find Pike, Terrence, and a bunch of other third-class slash tailies that she doesn't know. And she is scared and crying and begs them to leave, but Terrence says, well, if you see somebody you like, just take their dick. She ends up trying to get them to turn on Pike by saying that he sold her out, but 
He ends up getting annoyed about that and throwing her out of her own cabin. She ends up finding her way to third class and becoming friends with another outcast, Osweiler. Now, LJ isn't the only one getting used to her new role because Layton is another person dealing with his new role, but it's not just as the front of the train, it's as dad. He goes and talks to Zara, and Zara is convinced that their baby is going to be a girl, but she's concerned that they won't ever be able to get over the whole Josie situation, and Layton says, look, our family is never going to be as picture perfect as we thought, but we will make this work. And then there's Melanie, who is about to hunker down in the engine room, has decided that she's been putting off getting a therapy session at the night car for far too long. So she heads to the night car and does that therapy session with Miss Audrey, and it all focuses on her daughter and how upset she is that she put work first, she neglected her family, and she left her daughter on the platform to die. And she would give anything to hold her daughter again. After her therapy session, she heads to hospitality to have a conversation with Ruth, who still hasn't forgiven her for what she's done. And she has a whole new issue with being mad at her because of the fact that she's left the train the way it is to go hunker down in the engine. And Ruth kind of has a point. Snowpiercer is hurting at the moment. They're very understaffed. And they need leadership, and Ruth just doesn't think that Leighton is the person to do so. Melanie reminds her that democracy used to work, and sometimes you have to lose something to find it again. But Ruth can't accept that and can't get over the fact that she just killed all of those people, many of whom were Ruth's friends, including Commander Gray. It seems like this relationship can't be fixed, so Melanie says, I'll see you around, Ruth, and Ruth says, I think we've already said our goodbyes, and then she slams the door on her. So that seems to be one breakup. Another is Till and Jinju. Jinju is explaining to both Roach and Till how their crops are decimated by the looters, and now they're demanding that everybody get an equal share of calories, which is close to impossible because they're completely understaffed and have been working about 48 hours without sleep at this point. This morphs into a fight between Jinju and Till about the fact that Jinju didn't tell her about the Mr. Wilford situation. And the fight comes to a crescendo when Jinju says, well, I guess we're in agreement now. The train is all that matters. And they seem to break up amicably. Now we'll move to the front of the train where Javi has been fixated on this music that's coming through that radio frequency they rarely use. Then it brushes it off as nothing, but he sees something on the satellite feed and decides it's best to turn that feed off and act like it's not working. But he can't brush it off forever because when Melanie arrives, the first thing that Javi brings up is the music going on, and the first thought that she has is, oh my god, there might be survivors out there. She has to see the satellite, but that's gone. The directional antenna has also been cut by Bennett, who is claiming that he's trying to get everything back on board. So they're having trouble triangulating exactly where the signal is coming from, but they know that they're getting closer to it because the signal is getting stronger. And they also know that if they don't slow down, they're going to miss it. So she says, I got to get Leighton up here. But Bennett says, you don't need Leighton. Come on. She says, no, I do, because we're ushering in a new era and I need his approval on this. So Melanie was dead serious about handing the train over to Leighton. And Leighton at the moment is in the third class dining hall dealing with an issue after Roach caught a couple of tailies stealing a cart of lettuce. Leighton says, come on, where were you taking the lettuce? And they admit that they were taking it up to first class where Pike is. So now Leighton has that issue to deal with. But he has to abandon that situation when he's called to the engine. And when he gets there, Melanie fills him in on all the details. He asks if it's even possible that there are survivors, and she says, I mean, maybe. It's been six years since we've gotten a hit on this thing but they don't use it very often. All the while, Bennett keeps pushing it off like it's nothing. Melanie, though, knowing it's something, lays out the two scenarios for Leighton. The first is that they can take speed off, but if they do that, they'll be in deficit. They're going to be using more power than they can actually generate. They're already near emergency reserves, and they're planning on slowing down near Chicago. The other scenario is they race past the signal without pinpointing it, and if they do that, it's going to be a whole other revolution before they're coming back to it. Leighton says if there's any possibility that there are other survivors out there and we're not alone, then it's our duty to make contact and Melanie agrees. So they order the train to slow down. So they slow the train down and they're able to locate where that signal was coming from and it's coming from a completely other train. And that other train is set to meet them at a junction point. Melanie, feeling like this is Mr. Wilfred, is now worried that they're going to be boarded by this other train. And the mess says they're not going to be able to outrun this train. She tells Leighton, if Wilfred boards us, it's going to be worse than whatever we just went through the past couple days. So Leighton says, okay, well then I'll get some guys down training the tail to make sure that doesn't happen. Before he leaves, though, Melanie warns him that if he is able to get on the train, the cars are going to be divided. And boy, is that ever true. Because while Melanie is worried about Mr. Wilfred's return, Ruth, who is in first class, is ready to roll out the red carpet. As Leighton is making his way down to the tail, he picks up Pike from first class, kicks him out, and brings him back to the tail to fight off any Wilford intruders. While Leighton makes his way towards the tail, Melanie is using every ounce of power that she has to try to outrun Mr. Wilford's train. But it's not enough, as the second train is able to get a hold of Snowpiercer. It also tries to hack the train to slow the engine down, and Melanie knows that there's only one way to stop the train from being hacked, and that's to go outside on the top of the train and cut the uplink, which is extremely 
extremely dangerous. Melanie and Bennett go to put their suits on to head outside, and Melanie asks Javi to keep Mr. Wilford at bay as long as he can. Right before Melanie is actually to go outside, though, to cut the uplink, Bennett makes a plea to her not to do it. Because in his opinion, they need that supply train. Snowpiercer is quickly falling apart, and they need everything on that other train. But Melanie says, how do you know that any of the things that you're saying are on that train are actually on that train? And more importantly, what is Mr. Wilford going to want? She then accuses him of knowing the entire time that they were going to run into Mr. Wilford's train, and he admits that, yeah, he saw it on the satellite feed and killed it because he thinks it's best for the train. So since he made that decision by himself, she makes a decision by herself and cuts his hose so he can't go out. And then she heads out by herself to cut the uplink. But right before she does so, she tells him that whether she dies or not, he will keep Snowpiercer going one way or the other. So as Melanie heads out in the freeze on the moving train, she's too late. Mr. Wilford is able to stop the engines and Melanie ends up flying off the train into the snow. Layton, who is in the tail, is waiting with the rest of the tailies for Mr. Wilfred to get through the steel door when Ruth shows up with literally a welcome committee of children. They tell Ruth to get out of there, but she ends up pulling a gun on them, claiming how she's hospitality and it's her job. And while this might be Layton's democratic experiment, she is the head of hospitality and she will be there to greet Mr. Wilfred upon his return. So Layton orders everybody to put their weapons down and tells Ruth that she will be at the front of the train along with Layton side by side when Mr. Wilford arrives. And she likes this idea and ends up handing over the gun. But when the door opens up, it's not Mr. Wilfred. It's a girl. She announces to everybody that Mr. Wilfred has overtaken their engine and they have 13 minutes until the cold overtakes them. So they need to decide whether or not to peacefully surrender. Layton says that they need to see Mr. Wilfred face to face, but the girl says, is Melanie Cavill here? And since the tale is unaware that Melanie Cavill has actually been thrown from the train and is outside of it, they say, yeah, she's alive. Why? Who are you? And that's when she reveals that she is Alexandra Cavill. She's Melanie's daughter. And she wants to see her mother, who unfortunately is outside of the train with no real hope of getting back inside. Season 2 of Snowpiercer picks up right where Season 1 left off, with the members of Snowpiercer inside begging Alex to restart the train. The longer it sits there, the colder it gets. But instead of restarting the train... Alex gives them a list of items that she needs, and they have 12 minutes to get it, or else it's going to be too cold for them to ever move again. So Leighton and the group jump into action to get everything on the list. And the last item on the list is Mr. Wilford's favorite bottle of scotch, which Miss Audrey just happens to have a bottle of in her safe. But right before she hands it over to Leighton, she tells him, This is just the beginning. Mr. Wilford's going to take everything we just fought for. But Leighton doesn't have enough time to weigh the pros and cons of this thing. Now, while the passengers of Snowpiercer were getting the items, Ben and Javi were up front, trying to figure out if they can get the train restarted. And the problem is, Mr. Wilford has complete control of Snowpiercer. They're able to finally get in touch with Melanie, who is still stuck outside, and she lets him know that she's at the connector, but they say, you can't disconnect the trains. And she goes, no, I'm aware of that. We drained the banks too low, running from them to ever get moving on our own again. Which is something that Bennett warned her about, and she apologizes for. But she also knows that if she's able to break the uplink, she'll be able to get the life systems and some of the helm back. So it's a start. And she starts Paul bunioning this thing, taking an axe to it. And after a few whacks, she's able to kill the uplink. Shortly after that, though, the train starts moving again because Alex came back for the items. Along with this big, huge white dude that kind of like Mr. Wilford's version of the mountain from Game of Thrones. Ah, he's terrifying looking. Everyone's freaked out by him. But Alex and this guy grab all the items, go back to Big Alice, which is the train that Mr. Wilford's on, and close the door. So when the train gets started, Melanie is actually underneath it. And she sticks a detonation charge in one particular spot, and she's able to roll out underneath the tracks. And Ben is yelling at her to get back on the train, but all she can focus on as she's laying in the snow is this one snowflake that hits her suit. And she says to him, I think it's snowing. And Javi is convinced that she's going crazy, but she's dead serious. She truly believes it's snowing, which is impossible because Ben tells her it's too cold to snow. He starts pleading with her to get up and get on the train, and then she realizes, yeah, I probably should do that. It is moving. But before she hops on, she grabs a snow sample, and she's able to hop on the last car, which is Big Alice. She lets Ben know that she's on. A voice comes over a loudspeaker and tells her to take her suit off to disinfect. And as she's taking her suit off, you see she's dealing with frostbite, especially on her shoulder, after her suit was punctured. After disinfecting, she changes into a maintenance man-like outfit, and she walks out where two crew members of Big Alice are waiting for her. One is named Kevin, and he actually knows Melanie Cavill. The other is named Sykes. Melanie has no idea who she is. But Kevin is so pissed off that Melanie once left him for dead that he hits her with a cattle prod. He then takes her up to meet Mr. Wilfred. 
And when Melanie gets up there, Mr. Wilfred's dog is actually the first one to greet her. But it's not long before Mr. Wilfred reveals that he's sitting far back in the car. First thing he asks her is who she has up in the front driving his train. And she refuses to answer it, although he's pretty sure that it's Ben. She tries to change the subject, though, saying, how'd you do it? I mean, how did you drop in on us in Chicago? I know you're dying to tell me. And he reveals that after she left them, he got Big Alice to idle. And by the time Snowpiercer was on the other side of the world, he had outfitted Big Alice. He tells her how he was always working and was just waiting for his moment to pounce. And that was it. She has figured out, though, that he must have taken a shortcut going over the test track of the Rocky Mountains. He agrees to tell her everything if she just hands over the keys, but she says, I'm not going to do that. And he says, oh, yes, you will. You might have caught my uplink, but I can still drop anchor. I can grind you guys to a hole. He tells her how he wants his train back, but she explains how up until a few weeks ago, he was still, quote, running the train. People thought he was there. But after a Taylor revolution, she no longer has control of the train. It's not hers to give up anymore. But then in walks Alex. And this is the first time that Melanie is seeing Alex, and she is shocked to see that Alex is alive. Although Alex doesn't refer to her as mom, she refers to her as Melanie. She tells Alex whatever this guy told you is a lie, and Alex kind of looks at her cross-eyed and says, Which part was a lie? The part where you stole his train and left me for dead? How is that a lie? And Melanie tries to explain how she sent people to pick up Alex and her grandparents, but those people never returned. She waited. And she has so much to tell her. But you can also see that Wilfred has dug his claws into Alex and kind of poisoned her mind about Melanie Cavill. He gets Alex to change the subject, and she starts telling Wilfred how their society in Snowpiercer is an absolute mess right now. It seems like some guy named Leighton is in charge. She saw Breakman Roach and the head of hospitality, Ruth. She didn't, however, see any jackboots. Kevin then comes in and asks if everybody's okay, and Alex says, no, everything's not okay. Take Melanie to the brig. But it doesn't take long for Alex to go visit her mom. Although, it's not like she's had a real change of heart. She asks her mom, ah! She asks Melanie what it's like outside, because she hasn't been outside since she was a child. And Melanie tells her it's really cold. They have a conversation about how Alex remembers a little bit of the old world, but this, the train, is their world now. Melanie then asks what happened with Alex and her grandparents, and she tells Melanie that Her grandparents just didn't want to leave. They wanted to die there. And Alex didn't want to leave her grandparents. Melanie then tries to explain why she sent Alex away to live with her grandparents. But that's when Alex's mood shifts. And she said, yeah, I know why you did it. It's because you had a train to steal. But Melanie says, no, it was to keep you from him, meaning Wilfred. Although Alex points out that it was Wilfred who was the one who saved her life. Alex then pulls out the vial of the snow sample and asks what it was, and Melanie tells her it was a snow sample. I haven't been outside of Snowpiercer in seven years. But Alex is convinced that it's yet another lie from her mother, and she just walks off, leaving her mom in the break. Now, over in Snowpiercer, they're locked out of Big Alice. Big Alice can come into Snowpiercer, but Snowpiercer can't go into Big Alice. And because of this, they need to fortify the tale, just in case Wilfred attacks. Leighton gives the order and then tells Ruth and a few others that he'll address the entire train after a council meeting in the night car. And at that meeting, Ben is the first one to speak. He tells everybody that while they have full engineering control at the moment, Big Alice is really nothing more than an anchor. They can drop it at any time. And while originally Big Alice was a supply train, there's really no way to figure out how it's been retrofitted. Ben figures it could fit 200 at the moment, but he does admit that that estimate is probably high. Ben's big concern, though, is the fact that Melanie is their prisoner. Although one of the members of First Class says that they're done fighting. They don't want another war. And Leighton knows that's true. He knows that they need rest and time to regroup. But Ruth tries to get everybody to calm down, saying they haven't invaded yet. We need to chill. She thinks there's a chance that Melanie is on Big Alice while they're having this meeting, working things out with Wilford and Alex. But Audrey points out that Mr. Wilford isn't interested in just controlling the train. He wants to control everybody. And just to get order back in the car, Leighton points out that Wilfred does not control Snowpiercer. Snowpiercer controls Snowpiercer. And that little speech kind of gets everybody unified. But then he turns to Ruth, Till, and Roach and tells them that they're not going to start talking until Wilfred gives Melanie back. Ruth then walks away and Leighton turns to Till and Roach and tells them that they need to get a force together and to keep Ruth out of it. Now, Till thinks it's a terrible idea because they have no idea what is behind that door. But Leighton points out that they need to strike first before Wilfred strikes. They need to do a preemptive attack to get Melanie back. He knows that Wilfred has a plan, so Leighton figures that he needs to hit Wilfred before Wilfred hits them. Now, Ruth isn't privy to this conversation, but she does notice that Zara is getting some flack from a couple of tailies upstairs and points it out to Leighton. And when Leighton goes upstairs to see what they're arguing about, it has to do with the fact that Zara gave up Josie, and they blame Zara for Josie's death. But Leighton tells him that Zara was just reacting because Melanie was kind of holding her hostage. But even after that explanation, they still want justice for Josie, and that's when Zara tells him, hey, I'm pregnant. 
and that changes the mood. Ruth tells her that if she is pregnant, they need to get her up trained because she's a target. A pregnancy on Snowpiercer is kind of a miracle. But some of these tailies aren't a big fan of Leighton's new democracy. Ruth then takes both Leighton and Zara to a first class car that was previously owned by an old couple that took cyanide pills once the tailies broke through. She set them both up to be comfortable during the pregnancy. He tells her that it's not the best look that he's getting Zara, this preferential treatment, but, but Ruth points out that she's pregnant. They have to. He then addresses the train, telling them that while it pains him to say it, they have to put the democratic experiment on hold for the moment and institute martial law. And that is a decision that does not go well with a lot of people. But Bennett points out what other choice does he have? Now, down at the tail, as they try to fortify it, Pike gets a knock at the door from somebody who is on Big Alice looking to trade weed for fruit. And that is a deal that is too good to pass up for my man Pike. So he quickly grabs a tangerine and an apple and trades it for the ganja. And as Leighton and Roche are making their way down back to the tail, they smell the weed. And it doesn't take long for them to discover Pike blazing that shit up. But instead of getting angry at Pike, when he finds out how he got the weed, Leighton now knows how they're going to get into Big Alice. Now, back in Big Alice, Alex told the doctors there that Melanie is dealing with frostbite. So they handcuff her, they put a bag on her head, and they bring her down to get patched up. And the two doctors, who were named the Headwoods, immediately recognize Melanie, and Melanie actually recognizes them. And they're a little eccentric. They're kind of weird. But they do end up getting her patched up and put this ointment on her frostbite, which they say, once it heals, you won't even be able to tell it was ever there. She then needs to get ready because she's having dinner that night with Wilfred. And as they're eating, they start reminiscing about starting this whole train together. But that's when Wilfred gets word that Snowpiercer breached the door. And it really didn't take much effort. Pike knocked on the door and told them that he was willing to trade more food for drugs, and it was actually Kevin who agreed to it. And once they opened the door, Snowpiercer's group burst on through and started making their way up Big Alice. So when Wilfred finds out, he tells Sykes to send in Icy Bob. And Icy Bob was that mountain-esque guy that we saw earlier. And when he shows up, it is bad news for the Snowpiercer group. He starts throwing people around. He also pulls a lever that makes it about 70 below zero in the car. So not only are they getting their ass kicked, they're freezing on top of it, and it forces them to back up. Although as Icy Bob is walking through it, you realize why he got that nickname, because the low temperature isn't even affecting him. Before he closed the door on the group, he flips them off, and then he closes the door. Now, there's one person that's really pissed off at Leighton for making this push into Big Alice, and it's Ruth. He tells her not to take it personal, but she says, How can I not take it personal? You saw it fit to tell the engine, but you didn't see it fit to tell hospitality. He tells her that they didn't lose any ground, and in fact, they got what they came for, which is a prisoner, and that prisoner is Kevin. Kevin warns him, though, that this is a big mistake. Wilford doesn't care if you die. He can restart everything. And it might be a big mistake, because over in Big Alice, Wilford is pretty pissed off that they took a prisoner and think that that's going to work. And finally, all that anger that he's been bottling up inside flows out of him. He yells at Melanie for trying to steal his train when he, quote, built the world. He brings up the fact that he saved her from a little podunk farm, and he made her what she is today. But the big disagreement that they have is the fact that Wilfred thinks that the new world is the train, and Melanie thinks that the world is the world. She says there's no solution until we can figure out how to go back outside. He then drags her to the engine room of Big Alice, where Alex is sitting in the cockpit because she is an engineer now. And he tells Alex to bring Snowpiercer to a halt, which she does. And over at Snowpiercer, Javi and Bennett are worried that if he disconnects, they're dead. Because they know that they can't restart the train again, and they're just going to freeze to death. Wilfred warns Melanie that if she can't get Leighton to give up the train, then they're just going to disconnect, go in reverse, and by the time they come back, everybody on Snowpiercer is going to be dead. And it'll be Melanie Cavill's job to compost all of her dead friends. But giving up the train isn't Melanie's call, so Wilfred instructs Alex to disconnect, and Melanie starts pleading with her daughter not to do it because it's not the right thing to do. All those innocent people are going to die on board. She tells Alex that Snowpiercer is their future. They need it to survive. But Alex ends up giving into the bullying of Wilfred and presses the button. And when she does that, there's a big explosion because that detonation charge that Melanie put under the train when she was outside of it, well, it goes off. She had planned this whole thing out. She knew that this might happen. And when that detonation charge went off, it connected the two trains. They cannot disconnect. Even Alex is impressed with this plan, but Wilfred, he's livid. He realizes that the only option they have is to get Snowpiercer back up and running or else everybody dies. So he reluctantly gives the order, and some people on Snowpiercer, mainly Kevin, say, Oh, thank God, he spared us. But Leighton looks at him and says aloud, We're in for a long, cold war.
In the second episode, Zara and Leighton wake up in first class, and before she starts her day, Leighton warns her, hey, you better be careful of the tails. They're still pretty pissed off at you for what you did to Josie. But she reassures them that she'll be okay. And then get a visit from Till. And Till and Leighton walk out where Till lets Leighton know that half of the train is thrilled that Wilford's back while the other half thinks he, he's there to kill him. She also lets him know that adding 400 tailies to the population hasn't really done a lot to boost morale. And that there was actually an assault last night with a tailie near the tea room and Leighton says, well, do you know who it is? And she says, no, I don't. He says, well, go ahead, find out who it is. But she reminds him, I'm no longer a break man. So he decides to fix that dragging her to Roach's office and swearing her in as the new train detective. She fights back on it initially, but eventually she gets convinced to take the job. So with this new job title, she heads off to try to find out exactly what happened to the tailie. Leighton and Roach, however, stick behind because they want to interrogate Kevin. Now, Kevin resists at first, giving a very impassioned speech about how important hospitality is and how much he loves Mr. Wilfred. But once they put wings in front of him, he starts singing because he's hungry and he hasn't had wings in seven years. So he's starts devouring them and in order to get more wings he tells them that there's about 100 crew members on big alice and when leighton asks about icy bob he tells him that he's not sure well he's not 100 percent sure whether it was skin grafts or synthetic skin icy bob was augmented to deal with the cold now over at big alice alex visits melanie and lets her know that the headwoods had tested her snow sample and it came out to exactly what you would think it was but melanie asks if there's ammonium sulfate in it and alex says yeah there is now, Alex dismisses this, but Melanie lets her know that the reason she asked was because she's pretty sure that it was snowing. And Alex reminds her that that's impossible. She chalks it up to another one of her mother's lies. She then brings her up to meet with Wilfred because now it's Wilfred's turn to interrogate his prisoner, who sparks a joint and lets her know that even though that she thinks she's won this little battle, they can take precautions to slow the train to a crawl, making life on Snowpiercer a living hell. And people on Big Alice won't be too affected by it because... They're already built for the cold. And he asks her, how long do you think Leighton can really keep order? And she tells him, "Ah, he might surprise you. So Wilfred says, okay, then I guess it's time we meet him then. So Wilfred writes up a letter and sends it to the tail, and they're worried that it's filled with anthrax, so they call Ruth from hospitality, and immediately Ruth knows what it is, and she is happier than like a pig in shit. She geeks out over the fact that it was in Wilfred's handwriting. And in front of Leighton, Roach, and Ben... She reads the letter aloud, which basically says it's time for Wilfred and Leighton to meet, and they might as well do it over a prisoner swap between Kevin and Melanie. Right away, Roach is against it, but Ruth says, you know, eventually we're going to have to talk to this guy. I mean, he's connected to the train. And Ben concurs, saying, yeah, I have to be in sync with his engine. It's pretty annoying. But Leighton's having trouble figuring out why you would swap Melanie, who's super important, for a guy from hospitality. And Ruth tells him it's because Wilfred values hospitality. They don't know how valuable Kevin is to him. So with that in mind, Leighton says, all right, let's do it. We know that they're hungry. We know they have about 100 people. They're going to be watching us, so we'll just watch them. Let's bring Melanie home. So they head to the prisoner swap where Wilfred does, in fact, meet them there. And Wilfred's ability to sweet talk a room is second to none. I mean, he's got Ruth eating out of the palm of his hand. Leighton actually has to shut this campaign down to remind everybody what they're actually there for. Melanie starts making her way over back to Snowpiercer. And as Melanie is making her way back over to Snowpiercer, Alex all of a sudden bursts through and says, hey, hold on. She's holding the sample in her hand and she says, just tell me what it is. And Melanie says, I don't know yet. Come with me and we can test it together. But Alex just shakes her head, smashes the vial on the ground and says, no, you're seven years too late and walks back. So with Melanie back over to Snowpiercer, she meets with Leighton as they head to the engine. Leighton asks her, what's Wilfred's deal right now? And she says, he was planning that attack for about seven years. Right now, he's just winging it. But make no mistake, he's coming for you, Leighton. They then arrive at the tail where Melanie is telling Javi and Ben about the scientific labs they have over on Big Alice, pointing out her third-degree frostbite, which is all but healed thanks to the Headwoods mystery cream. She then tells them about her theory, that the chemical that was used to freeze the earth has been found in the snow, which means that it's actually hotter up in the atmosphere than it is down below, meaning the earth is cooling down. So they grab Leighton and they fill him in on this theory, which he's a little confused because it's the same temperature every day, but they explain how it would be hotter up top. But in order to test this, they had to shoot some weather balloons off of Snowpiercer to make sure of this. And sure enough, Melanie's theory is dead on. It's hotter the farther you go up in the atmosphere. And this completely changes everything. They weren't planning on this in their lifetime. And with this information, Melanie knows that she needs the proper equipment, which is over at Big Alice. The problem is she knows that Wilford isn't just going to sign over that stuff if he's not in charge. Layton figures, though, that with this new information, this could be the hope that Snowpiercer needs. Because right now, the train needs a rallying cry. 
So he figures, let's use Wilford's ego against him. Let's meet up with him in front of a bunch of witnesses on the train, tell them the discovery, and let him be the bad guy. Let him be the one to say, no, we don't need this. She tells Layton, it is risky, but in order to go through with this plan, he's gonna need Ruth on his side. So he has Ruth write up a message to Wilfred, and she delivers it. And Sykes brings it to Wilfred because Wilfred is down one hospitality guy. Once Kevin came over, he drew him a bath telling him that he'd earned it. But once Kevin hopped in, that's when the questioning started. And through it, Kevin sheepishly admitted that he took food from Snowpiercer. And that's when Wilford got really weird, taking off his clothes and hopping in the tub with Kevin, but then handing him a razor blade to slit his wrist with, because he tells him, you messed up. You told them that we were hungry. And this isn't the first time because you took mangoes earlier. Now, Kevin doesn't want to kill himself, but Wilford is such a smooth talker that he convinces Kevin to slit his wrist, while once again, Wilford oddly sits in the tub with this guy's blood. It's weird. It's just weird. So Sykes brings up the letter, and it's an invitation to Wilfred to meet them in the first-class dining car to tell them about a scientific discovery. And Wilfred sees this as an opening, not to attack anyone on Snowpiercer, but to attack Leighton. So he tells Sykes to accept the offer, but he doesn't want to be the one to attack Leighton. He wants Alex to do it, once again using his sweet-talking skills to manipulate her. And the plan is to have her hide a razor blade in her mouth, pop it out at the right time, connect it to a handle, and cut him up. And initially, Alex thinks this has to do with getting back at Melanie, but he spins this dramatic tale and convinces her that when the time strikes, she's going to do this. Now, before this meeting is going to take place, back over at Snowpiercer, Pike meets Terrence to trade weed for encyclopedias, which even he jokes he never thought he'd be doing. But after this transaction, Terrence gets some visitors from LJ and Osweiler, two people that are down on their luck and they need a sense of purpose or something to do. They want to get back in Terrence's good graces. Osweiler tells him, look, you know I'm good with my fists. And LJ tells him that while she doesn't have connections on Snowpiercer anymore because her parents died, she has connections on the other train. But Terrence is very, very leery about their motives, not trusting them one bit. So he offers them a janitor shift, which LJ scoffs at at first, but Osweiler, knowing that beggars can't be choosers, grabs the mop and heads off to clean up the stalls. Now, Detective Till went on the hunt to find out what tail he got attacked, and it's a tail he named Lights. And attacked is one way of putting it. They chopped off her fingers, put a bag over her head. She has no idea who did it. What she does know is that it was near the tea room. So that's where she heads. And the tea room is sort of this quasi-church where all religions can meet. And she meets with the pastor there, a guy named Pastor Logan, who tells her that he didn't see anything and he didn't hear anything, but he'll ask around. She notices, though, that he kind of has a shrine in the place to Wilfred. So she asks him, how's the train feeling to you? I mean, Wilfred was dead and now he's resurrected. And Logan admits that it is a powerful narrative. He tells her, you know, some people will bend their faith to fit the narrative. And she says, you mean Wilfred believers. So she's come up with a theory. And before Layton meets with Wilfred, she lets him know that she believes this wasn't an attack on third class. This was an attack by people who are big fans of Mr. Wilfred that want to cause chaos in Snowpiercer. And it makes sense because there are a lot of supporters on Snowpiercer for Wilfred. As he makes his way through the cars, there's a bunch of people that are thrilled to see him back, throwing up his W's. And LJ is actually one of those people. She runs up to Wilfred, tells him who she is, and then tells him how much support he still has on the train. But Layton doesn't have much time to think about this theory because he has a meeting to get to. And in front of a bunch of people, Layton, Melanie, Wilfred, Alex, the Headwoods, they all meet. And Melanie tells him about her scientific discovery telling everybody that they need to work together to fix this. But in order to do that, they need to get a research station in the Rocky Mountains back up and running. Although, Sykes lets her know, we just ran that line. Snowpiercer will never make it. Melanie ignores that, though, continuing on with the second thing they need to do, which is release a network of balloons around the continent to find which spaces of the world are going to be hotter, faster, so they can repopulate the planet. But Wilford is skeptical. He gets up and announces to everybody that Melanie Cavill already sold the train from him. There's no lie too small for her. And Layton tells him what she's telling you is the truth. And the Headwoods actually back up her theory, saying it does hold water. So Wilford thinks about it and says, okay, well, to get the research station back up and running, somebody's going to have to man that for a month. And he thinks he has the perfect person to do that. It's Melanie Cavill. And there's some pushback from Layton. And even Alex is surprised by this, but Melanie doesn't put up a fight. She's always figured that she would be the one to man it if it came down to this. So those are Wilford's terms, and Melanie's terms are simply that the hostility between Big Alice and Snowpiercer stop. She tells him the trains have to work together, and Wilford chuckles at this, saying, well, I want nothing more than that. So she tells him, then I'll send an inventory for what I'm going to need. And then she proclaims the entire car that the future is outside and everybody erupts. But right before Alex is to attack Layton, Wilfred whispers to her not to, and it actually causes her to cut up her hand quite a bit. 
He then starts making a speech and throws his W up, and that's an epiphany for Till, who is watching it. She rushes down the lights to see what fingers were chopped off, and it's just as she suspected. Whoever attacked lights chopped off the thumb and the pinky, leaving just the W. She now knows that the attack on lights wasn't an attack on the tail, it was a message from pro Wilford people. Now, while Till was confirming this, Melanie is walking Alex and Wilford out. But before Alice crosses over, she looks at Melanie and says, don't tell me this is for me. And Melanie says, it's not. It's for all of us. And that's when Alex crosses over, but before she does, she smashes her bloody hand on the wall, smearing it, leaving a mark. Now, the reason that Leighton didn't accompany them is because Zara had quite a day. She headed to the recovery room where she saw Josie, who was badly frostbitten. I mean, the entire body. To the point where the medical staff has her listed as a Jane Doe. And she tells the nurse practitioner she doesn't know Josie when she does. And with things going good with Leighton, she's worried about the competition or about Leighton's feelings with her. So she actually tries to kill her, meddling with her fluids bag, but she thinks better of that and decides not to. And after a talk with Miss Audrey, she's decided to let the past be the past. And she tells Leighton that Josie is in the medical wing. And Leighton flies down there. And to his surprise, not only is Josie in front of him, she's actually awake. In episode three over breakfast, Wilfred is telling Alex that this is the perfect situation for them. Melanie is going to go off on a suicide mission thinking she's saving the world and it's going to leave Leighton in charge of the train. He says this will be more fun than actually slitting his throat. They then, though, get a phone call from Snowpiercer and they're on with Melanie, Leighton, Javi, and Ben. And they're all going through how difficult this plan is to get Melanie to this station. They're going through a stretch of track called the Neckbreaker. And it's called that for a good reason. It's going to be extremely difficult to get Snowpiercer along with Big Alice over the test track, and they're going to need to use Big Alice's booster to do so. So everybody knows how important this is, but also how risky it is. Now they need to get the equipment, and Melanie has Ruth send over her shopping list. She wants Ben to come with her to grab those supplies, but Wilfred says, no, that ain't happening because he can't stand Ben. So Melanie says, fine. I'll do it with Alex, and Wilford agrees to that. They then hang up, and Javi brings up the fact that Wilford isn't just going to hand over the equipment. He's going to fight you on some of that. And then Ben points out that they actually need some parts to fix Snowpiercer. But Leighton has a plan for that. He tells Melanie, I'm going to accompany you to the border. And as Melanie, Leighton, and Ruth head to the border, Melanie thanks Ruth for helping out, but Ruth gives her a lot of attitude and walks off. And Melanie turns to Leighton and says, my advice to you is, don't lie to her. I did it, and I regret it. And I'll probably never get her back. But if you're able to keep her, she's a really good person to have on your side. They then meet at the border where Ruth has set up a phone slash custom system, which Pike is pissed off at because it's going to make it really difficult to smuggle weed over. But they're standing there waiting for the door open. And when it does, Sykes walks through. And Ruth makes mention of the fact that shouldn't Kevin be doing this? But Wilfred, who is standing in Big Alice, says, yeah, Kevin's feeling sick. He might have picked up something on Snowpiercer. And as Wilfred starts looking over the list, he proves Javi's point because he starts telling her all the things on the list that she can't have, even though Melanie knows that he has enough of it. He can spare it. He's just being a dick. And as Wilfred is playing hardball, Leighton says, actually, we need more than that. We need supplies to fix Snowpiercer. And then he pulls out a cart of food and says, "Ah, you know, we're willing to trade. We'll trade you this food once a month for parts to fix Snowpiercer. And Leighton's doing it because he knows full well that the members of Big Alice are hungry. And everybody behind Wilfred is looking at this tray of food salivating at the mouth, but Wilfred doesn't give in right away. He just says, yeah, I'll think about it. So Melanie comes aboard with Wilfred to get the supplies, but Alex is nowhere to be found because she was actually in the supply car getting the supplies ready. One of the 27 supply cards that Big Alice has. And Wilfred starts mocking the fact that Melanie's going to die before she actually saves the world. And that's when Alex pops up and tells Wilfred that he can go. She'll handle it from there. Her and Melanie then start getting the supplies ready while also discussing the different scenarios that she might encounter trying to get to the station. Melanie, though, changes the topic to just what Alex is into. And Alex doesn't say anything. But emotions get the best of her, so she turns to Melanie and says, what do you hope to get out of this in the next few hours? And Melanie says as much as possible. But Alex is hurt because they're packing Melanie's stuff so that she can leave once again. She left once before, but now it's twice. It's a choice. And Melanie isn't happy about it. She knows it sucks, but she also knows that for Alex to have any hope of a future, she has to do this. So Alex looks at her and says, all right, what do you want to know? And Melanie says everything. So Alex agrees to show Melanie where she sleeps. And they encounter another passenger on Big Alice who gives off the indication that Alex isn't supposed to be showing Melanie around, but Alex kind of tells her to get lost and mind her own business. And she shows Melanie the bunk that she sleeps in. And they start bonding over the things they like and 
the track and whatnot. And during this bonding experience, it's the first time that Alex refers to Melanie as mom. Melanie also teaches Alex to feel the train because she says the train will tell you more about itself than diagnostics will. And while feeling the train, she knows that there's a wheel loose on one of the cars. So after Melanie goes back to Snowpiercer, Alex heads up to the engine room of Big Alice to see if she was correct. But she's the only one there because Wilfred is down with the Headwoods doing an experiment on Icy Bob, getting him more acclimated to the colder weather for longer. And Bob goes longer than he's ever gone before at a colder temperature, but it's still not up to the standards that Wilfred wants. He tells the Headwoods, I want him to go colder and longer. He then heads up to the engine room of Big Alice where he sees Alex feeling the train just like Melanie used to. And he knows right away that it must have been Melanie who taught her how to do this. And Alex says she was right. There is a wheel loose on one of the cars and she's the only one that knew about it. And Wilford starts getting concerned that she is getting sentimental, not wanting to see her mom go. So he has her repeat, we want her off this train. Now, while Melanie and Alex were catching up, Leighton was dealing with the Josie situation. The Taylors are by her side really concerned, and they're not too thrilled with Leighton. But once he shows up, they let Leighton have his moment with Josie alone. And the first thing that Leighton does is apologize to her, but she says, for what? Getting back with Zara? I was dead. But he says, no, you weren't dead. You're here. You're alive right now. Josie tells Leighton, you know who did this to me. It was Melanie. And while Leighton feels bad about this, he tells her I had to make the alliance. But she looks at him really perplexed and lets him know you sacrificed 35 tailies, people that I convinced to fight. And the result of that has been nothing that we promised, and your leadership has come into question. Leighton kind of gets his back up and says, I believe the engineers. I believe in Melanie's plan. I believe that this is our best hope for a future. And because of that, it's now my job to defend all of that against Wilfred. But Josie lets him know that the Taylors see Leighton as a politician now. And Leighton needs her blessing or else he's going to lose them all. And for Leighton, that's something that he never even thought of. It's a lot to think about for Leighton, but he has other work to do. He links up with Till, who is on a mission to find out what happened to Lights. And Till shows Leighton, along with Roach, Light's hand, saying, look, it's a W. The good news is they think they have their first lead, and it's the Breachman. They love Wilfred, and they hate Tailies. So Roach and Till go to pay them a visit. And being a former Breakman, she's not the biggest fan of Breachmen. It's kind of like cops versus firefighters. And when Till and Roach question the Breachman, they kind of play dumb. Now, they're very loyal to Wilfred, and they're thrilled that he's back. I mean, they even have W's tattooed on their body, but they won't admit to cutting off fingers or even getting involved in the revolution. Till, however, doesn't believe him. Now, Leighton wasn't there because he headed to the front of the train, and he's talking to Ben about Wilfred. And Ben warns him that Wilfred can get jealous, but his jealousy isn't about objects or people. It's about power. He's obsessed with it. Leighton thinks that they might be able to find a way to use that against him. But Ben points out, you might be able to, but we still have to go halfway around the world with this guy. So whatever you're planning on doing, just remember, we can't have secrets. Shortly after that, everybody gets ready because they're about to hit the Rocky Mountain test track. And they're in communication with Big Alice where Wilfred lets them know that Alex will be the one who's actually steering the train for Big Alice. And Alex is nervous as hell. And unfortunately, they've reached a little bit of a hiccup. Snowpiercer doesn't have the reserves to get over the mountain. And so what they're going to have to do is pull the reserves from first and second class. And it gives Ruth all of 25 minutes to get everybody in the train to the night car. It's not a lot of time, and Ruth isn't thrilled about it, but she doesn't have a choice. The one place they're not pulling reserves from is the infirmary, and Leighton knows that Josie is going to be by herself. So while everybody is heading to the night car, Leighton heads to the infirmary to be with Josie. And when he walks in, Josie is holding a mirror because she wants to see what she looks like. So Leighton helps get the bandages off her face, and she sees in the mirror that, yeah, she looks pretty rough. Now, she definitely wants vengeance on Melanie Cavill, but she tells Leighton if Melanie's mission is the only hope of ever getting off that train, then then the Taylors have a new course. Now, in the night car, everybody seems to see that there's something wrong with Miss Audrey. She's just not acting herself. But Till can't take her eyes off the breachman. I mean, they're throwing up W's in her face. But Pastor Logan comes over to her and Roach, and she tells Logan that they were just never able to get their feet set and show everybody that they can trust in the new democratic system before Wilfred showed up. He tries to give her a St. Christopher medal, and at first, she rejects it, but she ends up taking it anyway. Of course, the real action is up in the front, and Snowpiercer's velocity is dropping quicker than they thought it would. They're going to need Big Alice's boosters at an exact time, but instead of helping her, Wilfred decides to use this as a learning experience for Alex. And she is, once again, 
nervous as hell. Now, this is out of Melanie's hands, and Ben lets her know that she can get the job done, although what choice do they have other than to have faith in her? But this is going to require Alex to time this at the just right time to turn on the boosters. If she does it too soon, they'll derail. If she does it too late, they'll end up having to go the opposite direction, and that'll take too long. But as she's trying to figure out when to hit the button, Wilfred is next to her, in her head, trying to manipulate her to either derail Snowpiercer entirely or mocking the fact that she doesn't want to let her mom go. She ends up blocking him out and getting the job done, but you can tell that Alex is pissed. And as soon as it's done, she leaves the front of Big Alice to go meet her mom at the exit point. Melanie is also headed there, and she reminds Leighton before she leaves about the mission at hand and about how the data is more important than her own life. She then heads down train to meet up with Alex, but Leighton knew that Pike was listening in, so he says, yeah, you can come out now. But Leighton tells him that he's going to allow him to link back up with his connection over at Big Alice, but only for weed. The one stipulation he has, though, is that Leighton is going to decide what he trades for that weed, and that is fine with Pike. A short while later, Melanie arrives at the border to go to her exit point. She's standing there with Ruth, and she tells Ruth that she can trust Leighton. He's a good guy. She also says that she needs somebody to look out for Alex, and she can think of nobody better to do that than Ruth. So she makes her promise that she will, and Ruth says, yeah, of course, as both women are crying. The door opens up, and Melanie and Alex head to the point where Melanie is going to jump out of the train. But right before she gets to the drop-off point, Melanie tells Alex, you know he put that pressure on you on purpose, right? When he ordered you to disconnect Snowpiercer, it's because he wanted all that death on your conscience. But just so you know, that's his cruelty. That's not yours. Alex gives her a giant hug and tells her that she actually wanted to hit the brakes. If she did so, it would have meant more time with Melanie. But Melanie whispers in her ear that that wasn't the mission. She tells Alex that there are people on Snowpiercer who will take care of her if she needs anything. And then right before she leaves, she tells Alex, I love you. And Alex says, I'll see you in a month, Mom. And then Melanie Cavill hops off the train and is on her own. In episode 4, we find out that Melanie did, in fact, arrive at the station, and Javi and Ben are ready to fire off their first weather balloon that she's going to have to connect to. That's not the only good news, though. The relationship between Big Alice and Snowpiercer are going really well. Their first trade of food for parts went off without a hitch. And during it, Mr. Wilford gave Ruth a message that she relays to Leighton, offering the Headwoods Frostbite Cream to some of the victims, which Ruth says that's really generous of him, but Leighton doesn't really think so. He writes something back on the note and gives it back to Ruth, but doesn't tell Ruth what it is. And as she's walking back, curiosity gets the best of her, and she reads it, rolling her eyes. And the message is, what do you want? And when Alex gets it, she reads it to Wilfred and jokes with him that what he wants is his paramour, Miss Audrey. But Wilfred says, no, what I want is much more fun. How about a night out on Snowpiercer? So he sends this note back to Leighton, who has to meet with Miss Audrey, because he knows that there's history with Miss Audrey and Wilfred. He knows that that's the reason why Miss Audrey has been acting weird ever since Wilfred showed back up in the picture. And if you're going to have a night out on Snowpiercer, it's going to have to be in the night car. So Audrey sits Leighton down and tells him her story about when she was 18, she was a high-class escort. And she would go to some of the fanciest parties in Chicago that were all hosted on Wilfred's trains. But she was exclusively his. And that had its perks, but she also has a massive suicide scar on her wrist. So it also had its negatives. And she's a little irked that Leighton wants to reopen up these wounds. And Leighton tries to pitch her on the mission, to which finally she says, Okay, I'll do it, but not for you guys. I'm doing this for me. So they send the acceptance back to Wilfred, saying that he can have his night out on Snowpiercer, but they want the guest list. And if they need a guest list, that means Wilfred is going to have to invite some of the crew. The party is being dubbed as a celebration of science because they're launching that first weather balloon. While discussing all of this with Sykes and Alex, Alex makes a quip once again about Wilfred wanting to go all around the world to get back to Audrey, and this time he snaps back at her, getting really, really upset. Cooler heads though prevail, and they figure out that they have three spots to offer to some of the crew, and they feel like the fairest way to do this is to put everybody's name in a hat and draw three names, although it's rigged. Now, Alex already has a spot. She's already going, but she sits down next to that girl who caught her with Melanie when she was showing Melanie around, who didn't exactly approve of the fact that she was showing Melanie around. Well, she's the seamstress on Big Alice. Her name's Amelia. And Alex tells her, don't freak out, but your name's going to get called. And sure enough, her name is the last one to get called, and she jumps up in the excitement because she's going to go on Snowpiercer. Now, back over at Snowpiercer, they're planning on Wilford's arrival. It's Roach, Till, Leighton, Audrey, Ben. And Leighton's big question is, is there anybody on this Getz registry that we can flip to our side? But Roach doesn't recognize any of the names. Ben speaks up saying, let's not forget that tonight's whole mission is connecting with Melanie. And it's of the utmost importance that Wilfred is on board with this. Leighton is aware of this, so he tells Ruth, make sure that Wilfred has the time of his life tonight. They also know that this is a leap of faith, because they don't actually know if Melanie is there to connect. 
They just know that she arrived at the station. Layton tells all of them, we need to have a great night. We need to show his crew what freedom looks like. That way he can't demonize us. But Audrey says, just rest assured, he'll be doing the same to us. He already has his claws in some of us. Some of us have known him for years. Which is true. They all pretty much have worked with him except Layton. So it's something to think about, and the meeting gets adjourned. Ruth then goes to meet the Headwoods at the border so that they can start fixing up some of the frostbite victims. And as they're administering goo on the second-to-last person, Layton says, okay, we have one more person for you to see, and it's Josie. Layton starts to escort them up train, and Ruth says, I know who they're going to see, and if they are going to see her, then I need to be there. But Layton gives her a look like, get out of here, you don't need to come, and just walks up train with the Headwoods. But when the Headwoods take a look at Josie, they realize that her frostbite is so bad, they're going to need to take her back to Big Alice and admit her overnight. Layton then kicks them out because he wants to have a private conversation with Josie. He's aware that the treatment probably does work. He's heard nothing but good things, but what he's worried about is that she would be too isolated. Josie gives him a cold dose of reality, telling him, I'm not going to recover from here, and you need eyes on Big Alice. So let me go, and I'll find out everything I can. I know you have something going on with Pike at the border. And Layton says, yeah, if everything goes well, we'll have a pipeline tonight. So it's pretty much set that Josie will be heading with the Headwoods back to Big Alice for treatment. After Layton leaves, she meets with some of the other tailies to say her goodbyes, but also telling them, no matter what happens to me, you have to trust Layton. They also have a goodbye surprise for her, and it's Miles, who she hasn't seen in a long time. She then packs up her stuff and has a very emotional taily farewell as she crosses over the border with the Headwoods. But over with Ruth, after the look that Leighton gave her, she's really annoyed and she vents to Zara about it, saying, Melanie told me to trust this guy, but it turns out that he doesn't even trust me. He thinks because I respect Mr. Wilfred that I'm not loyal, but I am loyal. I'm loyal to the train. And she is convinced that Leighton is trying to phase out hospitality. Now, she's venting to Zara because Zara housed Leighton's ear, but she's also venting because she knows that Zara knows how much she actually does. So Zara proposes that she join hospitality, which is something that Ruth is open to. Now, some other business going on the train is that Pipeline, in fact, is open between Pike and the drug dealers in Big Alice. He delivers some weed to Terrence for more encyclopedias, but as he's leaving, LJ, who is still continuing to do her janitorial shifts, is eavesdropping, overhearing their entire conversation. The other piece of business is with Till. She continued to track down Breachman Bach, thinking that there was something going on with him. She followed him to the tea room, where he was kind of praying to that Wilfred shrine. But in order to look inconspicuous, she was kind of hiding in the corner, and that's when she noticed pictures of all of the people they had lost on Snowpiercer, and she gets crazy emotional. To the point where Pastor Logan actually pulls her inside so they can have a private meeting where Till says that, yeah, it, everything hit her at once. Why did all of these people die and she's still alive, not feeling anything? So she is kind of an emotional mess when she finds out that Lights and some other tailies had grabbed Breachman Bach and threatened him for, quote, cutting Sykes' fingers off, even though he says that he didn't do it. A brawl ensues, which is eventually broken up with some of the brakemen and Leighton and Till show up. Till turns to Lights and says, I told you I would handle it, while Leighton talks to Bach trying to figure out his allegiance with Wilfred, saying, have you ever met him? And Bach says, yeah, I was building bridges for him in Siberia when I was 14. Leighton says, I guess that makes you a lifer, and when Bach says, I'm proud to say it does, Till snaps, kicking him in the face, which is something that takes Roach and Leighton completely off guard. They think it's totally uncalled for because they don't actually know if Bach did it. Till looks them both in the eyes, though, and says, I'm telling you, there's something else going on here. Leighton, though, doesn't have time to figure it out. He has to get up to first class to change for the party. And when Zara comes down in her hospitality uniform, he's not too happy about it, but he doesn't really have a say in it. On the other side, at Big Alice, Wilfred is kind of doing the same thing with the people that he's escorting over to Snowpiercer. Although he lets them know that he's praying that this night is a big disaster and that weather balloon pops in front of everybody. He then escorts everybody into the night car where they have a big celebration. It's very political with Leighton acting like he's best friends with Wilfred, Wilfred acting like he's happy to be there, and then everybody watches on a monitor as Javi and Ben explain the situation. They're going to release the weather balloon. Once it reaches a certain height in the sky, Melanie will connect, and then they're good to go. So they do that. The weather balloon gets released without a hitch, and now they have about an hour until it reaches that altitude in the sky. And that hour is going to be filled with entertainment for Miss Audrey. But before she goes on stage... Zara goes in to check on her, knowing that she's in a fragile state, and says, you don't have to do this, but Audrey's going to. And she gets up on that stage and puts on a hell of a performance. And when she faces Mr. Wilfred, you would never know that she was concerned about seeing Wilfred again. She looks completely unfazed. 
She then pulls him into the night car. She explains how she's kind of changed up the night car. It's no longer really for physical gratification anymore, more of what it's become. And she starts going through the process with Wilfred where the vision that he has is with Audrey in a party. But then all of a sudden he's sitting in a tub with Audrey because it turns out Kevin wasn't the only person that he peer pressured to commit suicide. He gave the razor blade to Audrey as well. And as he's having this vision, Audrey in the real world says, you made me cut my own wrist. And Wilfred says, no, no, I saved you. He then kind of backs her into a corner a little bit, just repeating over and over again, I need you, I want you. And in a scene that mirrors Margot Robbie, Leo DiCaprio, Wolf of Wall Street, Audrey pushes Wilfred back with her shoe and then starts feeding Wilfred a mango. It's kind of an awkward scene, but we're not going to kink shame on this YouTube channel because they seem to be having fun. And on the outside, other people are having fun, namely Till, who is hooked up with a bartender, and then the last Australian, who finds out he's not actually the last Australian, because Amelia is from Perth, so they start chatting it up, where Amelia tells the last Australian her story about how she was supposed to be on Snowpiercer, working in laundry, but she got left. And he says, well, is that what you do on Big Alice? But she says, we're not supposed to say. And he kind of looks at her cross-eyed and says, are you guys all right over there? But she gives a very unconfirmed, yeah, we're good. He doesn't buy it, though, so he gives her his lucky goggles, saying, put these on and somebody will contact you if anything happens to you. And then finally, Alex noticed LJ, and they both kind of recognize each other from the past. Didn't really seem like they were big fans of each other, but LJ pulls her aside because now that LJ is a janitor, she has clearance to pretty much everywhere. It's one of the perks of the job. And she takes Alex to an observation deck where they can see the northern lights, and they start talking about encyclopedias. LJ pulls out a joint, and LJ starts telling Alex what happened to her parents. And Alex, conversely, starts telling LJ about how she literally just started having a relationship with her mom until her mom had to go off. Alex, though, realizes that the balloon's probably at altitude level, so she goes to leave. But it does seem like LJ is trying to get her claws into Alex. And it was good timing by Alex because the balloon is pretty close to altitude level. So Zara has to go get Wilfred and Audrey out of the night car. And she knocks, but nobody answers. And when she opens the door, she awkwardly sees Audrey feeding Wilfred a mango. So she kind of just lets them be. Eventually, though, they both do come out. And Ben and Javi once again pop up on the projection screen, explain the situation, and it does take a while. People are nervous because the balloon is at the level, but nothing's happening. Although, finally, Melanie does, in fact, connect, and everybody starts clapping in excitement and joy. Except one person, Mr. Wilfred. He doesn't seem too thrilled. So after this, the party kind of ends. Everybody goes their separate ways. Some people are celebrating, having a good time. But Audrey was burning off steam by dancing. And Leighton comes in the night car and says, hey, what was the deal with you and Wilfred? Should I be worried? And she says, trust me, we have him right where we want him. Although you can tell she's still not over him. And he, Wilfred, has returned to the night car. But he goes to pay a visit on Leighton's girl, Josie, from afar, as she sits in the medical wing of Big Alice, and she can kind of feel his presence. In episode 5, Josie has done a good job of getting better, but also spying for Leighton. She's been able to pass messages to him through the trade, and one of those messages tells Leighton that she's pretty sure Wilfred's planning something, and it has to do with Icy Bob. In the meantime, however, Wilfred's just focused on his book club. They're discussing the next chapter when Sykes comes in and lets him know that their friend up train has planted the lantern, so they're good to go, and this really excites Wilfred. He hands Sykes a note to pass to Miss Audrey, And when Audrey gets it, it's an invitation for her to join Wilfred on Big Alice. So she lets Leighton know. And Leighton is concerned for her safety, but she tells Leighton, Wilfred is not going to hold me against my own will. She also knows that they need this, and she's willing to do it. So Ben shows her a control panel where when you switch the wires out, it'll give Snowpiercer the ability to listen in on Big Alice without Big Alice actually knowing it. So that'll be Audrey's task on top of just finding out what's going on in Big Alice. Leighton then calls a meeting with Ruth, Javi, Zara, Roach, and Till eventually shows up as well. Javi gives an update on how so far everything's going great with the weather balloons. They just released their latest one, they're waiting for Melanie to connect, and after that they only have one more. And Leighton tells them this is great, but we're still not safe. Because indications show that they're about to be attacked. So he wants to fortify some of the weaker cars. And Till questions why they're still continuing to do trade if they're hearing that they're going to be attacked. But Leighton says, we're still doing trade. He then kicks everybody out except Till and Roach and lets them know that he has a contact over in Big Alice and they need to keep the border open so that she can communicate. And they figure out that the contact's Josie. Till, though, is kind of having a meltdown because the brakeman and the breachman are at each other's throats and she still doesn't have a suspect for who cut off Lights' fingers. So Roach and Leighton tell her, why don't you just take a day? So she takes the day off and she heads to the bar where she is reunited with Osweiler and they start talking about train life and whatnot, but... 
he has to leave and go to his janitorial shift. And that's when one of the bartenders lets her know that some of the breach men have bought her a drink. They're really just screwing with her, and it's working. She's about to fight all of them. When Pastor Logan grabs her and pulls her away from getting in a fight. Taking her to the gym and throwing her some boxing gloves to spar with. He figures it would be best if she just get out that pent-up frustration. And it actually works. And after they spar, they start having a conversation about all the things that the train has gone through. Which morphs into the leadership on the train. And Pastor Logan doesn't seem like he's the biggest fan of Layton. And Layton is juggling a lot. The latest being that his pipeline in Big Alice is being threatened by Terrence. The pipeline was set up so that Pike could sell weed. But when Terrence caught him selling weed in his territory, he had LJ bash him in the head with a pipe and drag him over to Terrence, where Terrence threatened that if he ever did it again, he would kill him. So Layton patches up Pike and finds out the details and tells him, I'll handle this. He meets with Terrence, offering him a deal of 60-40 split, but telling him, if you don't agree to this, I'm going to arrest you because I have reason to. But Terrence doesn't back down, instead actually threatening Layton, because he's seen the little girl that passes the messages from the tale to Layton. So he threatens the little girl, but he also threatens to reveal Layton's contact in Big Alice because he's also figured out that it must be Josie. So Layton needs to figure out what to do, but he doesn't have much time to think about it because he has an ultrasound appointment with Zara. And at the appointment, he fills Zara in about what he's going through with Terrence, where Zara says if Terrence is threatening to expose Josie, then he's threatening us. He needs to be dealt with. But Layton says, we're not in the tale anymore. I can't do that. And Zara reminds him that you can sanction it. And that seems to be something that Layton hasn't even thought about. Now, over on Big Alice, Wilford is all Audrey'd up. I mean, he's been blasting her album for the entire train to hear. They're getting sick of it, mainly Alex. She's also angry at the fact that she's being left out in the dark and, and asks him, when are you and Sykes going to let me know what you have planned up train? But he just preaches patience to her. Alex then confronts him about the fact that Audrey is allowed to come to Big Alice, but she isn't allowed to go meet up with Lila Folger. And Wilford doesn't answer the question, just asking, are you worried that she's going to take your place? And she says, no, I'm worried you're getting soft. I mean, how does Audrey help us take Snowpiercer? And Wilfred chuckles, saying, that's where you watch the mystery unfold, my dear. A short time after, Audrey comes aboard, and she doesn't initially see Wilfred, she just sees Alex. And Alex gives her a ton of attitude. It's kind of like a daughter whose parents get divorced and her dad goes on a date with a new woman. Alex completely disapproves of the relationship. And when Wilfred does finally show up, Alex just storms out of there, leaving the two alone. And they have their little date, and things are going well, but... Audrey has a mission in handle. So she asks Wilford to make her a drink to get him out of the room, and she finds the control panel. And she starts to unscrew it, but she runs out of time. However, when Audrey walks further back in the car, Wilford does end up noticing that something was messed with the control panel, although he doesn't bring it up, just continuing the date. Now, things seem to be going well for Wilford on Big Alice, but things are not going well on Snowpiercer, where the latest balloon that they released has reached altitude where Melanie could connect, but she hasn't yet. And Ben's freaking out a little bit because Melanie hasn't been late connecting with any of these. And because of this, Ben and Javi call a meeting with the powers that be and let them know that they need to maybe plan for life without Melanie. Now the good news is they've launched enough balloons where they should be able to build a climate model. But at this point, it's important not to let Wilford know because they're about to turn around tomorrow to go back to get her. And if Wilford finds out about this, he's not going to want to turn the train around. So they need to act as business as usual, launch the last balloon, and lie to Wilfred, telling him that Melanie connected, as they just hope to God that she's okay. The group is kind of conflicted, though, about what to tell the people, because these connections have been a big boost for morale. And Ruth speaks up, saying, we need to lie. Unfortunately for Ruth, she's going to be the one tasked with lying. And unlike Melanie, she's not really cool with it. It's just something her morals don't agree with, even though she knows that it goes on. Zara actually has to remind her, you're a leader on this train. And at this moment, a white lie is actually needed. So Ruth gets in front of the microphone and makes the announcement. But Leighton had the issue about what to do with Terrence. What Zara told him has been sitting in his mind, and he finally agrees with it. He goes to Pike to commission him to kill Terrence, and Pike is really broken up about it, because ever since the cannibalism episode, he's been trying to live a better life, and this goes against it. And even though he doesn't want to do it, he knows he has to because of his loyalty for the tale. So he sneaks up to Terrence's bunk and slaps down one blade because he wants to make it a fair fight. And Terrence starts trying to haggle with him, saying that he will accept Leighton's deal, but it's too late. He tries a sneak attack on Pike, but it doesn't work. It's a pretty quick fight, with Pike stabbing him a bunch of times, and then taking, I assume, a caulk gun and stuffing his face full of it, killing Terrence that way. So that's one less issue that Leighton has to worry about. But Josie is over in Big Alice, continuing to do her job of spying for Leighton. And while getting treatment, the Headwoods get pulled aside by Sykes. 
Now, Josie can't make out full sentences, but she's hearing some things, like, this is too soon, this isn't what we agreed upon, and she can tell by their body language that the Headwoods are not happy. Problem is, she's going through a medical procedure and she starts to have a panic attack. And Icy Bob actually recognizes this, so he gives her steps, so he gives her steps to calm her down. Turns out, seems like a really nice guy. He gives her tips on how to deal with the pain, but also letting her know the Headwoods are not to be crossed. You want to do what they say. So, with the tips that Bob has given her, the next time she goes through a medical procedure, the Headwoods give her something to knock her out during it because it's extremely painful, but she doesn't take the medicine, hiding it away. This way, she's able to hear their conversation. And while she's keeping the pain inside, she is able to hear the Headwoods discuss the breachman, tonight, and this gives her enough information that night to write a note to Layton. But as she's stuffing it away in the laundry, she ends up getting caught by Icy Bob. He tells her, I saw you didn't take the medicine. And at first she plays dumb, but he's a pretty imposing guy. She asks him, are you going to tell them about this? But he says no. He just wants the meds. And when she hands him over, he says, you better know what you're doing. During the next trade, Layton ends up getting Josie's message that says, tonight, Breachman. And he knows he needs to act quickly. He tells Ruth, get Audrey back and then close the border ASAP. And then he grabs Roach to head to the Breachman room. But the only one there is Bach, and he demands to know where the others are, but Bach says, I don't know, they're around? Layton confronts them about attacking for Wilfred, but Bach denies it. And every time he's ever been accused of anything, Bach pleads his innocence. And that's when alarms start going off, because the Breachmans weren't the ones who were attacking. The Breachmen were the ones who were getting attacked. One by one, they're killed. And by the time that Till and Roach and Layton figure it out, it's too late. And when Wilfred and Audrey get to the border, the alarm is still going off. And Wilfred is smiling from ear to ear saying, what's going on over there, Ruth? But she doesn't know. Audrey turns to Wilfred and says, what did you do? But he doesn't answer the question, instead telling her that she can stay in Big Alice if she wants. He even extends that very invitation to Ruth, but Ruth says, I'm sorry, sir, I can't do that. Ruth then asks Audrey, are you coming? And Audrey looks at Ruth, looks at Wilfred, and then turns around. And Wilfred and Audrey walk back into Big Alice as the border door closes. In episode 6, we get a look at why Melanie took the train from Wilfred. Their relationship actually started off very strong as they built the train together. Melanie was the engineer, Wilfred being the architect. At one point, Wilfred even said that Snowpiercer was as much Melanie's as it was his. But as they continued to fine-tune the train, that's when the relationship started to fracture. It started during the plans for the night car, with Melanie thinking that it was a waste of time. She thought they needed more scientists and productive members of society, not a brothel. Melanie also thought that they needed less security, more scientists, with Wilfred thinking the opposite. They eventually came to an agreement, but this was the moment where Wilfred reminds Melanie who's in charge, saying that if she didn't like it, your family can stay behind because Snowpiercer runs on my order. And then finally, the day that Snowpiercer was set to launch, Javi is down train with Melanie and Ben in the engine room as Melanie is trying to get in touch with her family because they still haven't arrived on Snowpiercer. A crowd was outside forming, trying to get onto the train, and the crowd was growing by the minute. Wilford came storming in, blaming Melanie and Ben because the train's about to be overrun because of lack of security, something that he wanted. So this crowd is outside, the train's about to be overrun, and they still have about 30 minutes before they can even leave the station. Wilford is getting more and more stressed out, and then he looks outside and sees a group of people that he doesn't recognize claiming that they have tickets for the train. And Melanie says, yeah, those are the scientists that we agreed upon. Wilfred, though, says, no, they're not coming aboard. I need more jackboots. And Melanie tells him, I'm not leaving without all of them. She doesn't even wait for Wilfred to respond, saying, look, let's just let them on and argue about this later. We don't have time to sit here and squabble. And Wilfred says, no, you're right. And he radios to the soldiers to terminate them. And Melanie has to watch her scientists get gunned down. And this is absolutely shocking to Melanie. She barely hears Wilfred tell her once again, this train runs on my order. Watching her scientists get gunned down is really the last straw for Melanie. Wilford then tells her and Ben, I'm running down train and we'll open fire on anybody who tries to storm and get on in Snowpiercer. And after about 20 minutes, Melanie's family still hasn't arrived. But at this point, the crowd has broken through the gates. They get a message from Wilford saying as soon as he gets on the train, they're leaving. And Ben lets him know, yeah, that's fine. We have about six minutes until launch. But Ben then turns to Melanie and says, we can get this train out of here in one minute. You have to make the call, though, to go. And with Melanie's family still not on board... She tells Ben, I'm heading down train to find them. But he says, no, you can't get off this train. I'm not leaving you. We can't let that monster be in charge of what's left of humanity. If you want to save the train and save the future, we have to go now. So as Melanie is bawling her eyes out, knowing that she's leaving her family behind, she makes the tough decision to start the train and leave. This leaves Wilford outside, shocked as his train takes off without him. Now, present day Melanie is heading to the research center, and she arrives, but it was a tough journey. Her sled got stuck, and it forced her to walk the couple hundred yards to the station. While trying to force her way in, she notices a body outside that has a bullet wound to the head. And upon getting into the station, when she's looking around, 
she notices the body of a woman who slit her wrist. So it seemed like a pretty grim situation towards the end. She sets up shop with plans the next day to get the station up and running. She wakes up really early in the morning and starts clearing off the solar panels, but as she's doing it, she finds a third body. She keeps clearing off the panels, though, and is able, with the help of the sun and the solar panels, to power up the station. She then heads out to go get the rest of her gear from that stuck sled. Unfortunately, though, she arrives to see that it's all under an avalanche. And this leaves Melanie with one ration pack and a couple of pieces of candy for a month. And Tom Hanks, well, he had a volleyball, but Melanie doesn't have that. She's all alone in the middle of nowhere, and her mind starts playing tricks on her, where she starts having conversations with a fake Wilfred. And the fake Wilfred is kind of teasing her about the fact that she has no food, really, telling her that the woman who slit her wrist did it after about three months. And Melanie reminds fake Wilfred that she only needs to last one month, as she draws up a calendar on the board to figure out how many days left she has until Snowpiercer returns. She then just sits and waits for the first balloon to connect, and when it does, she's thrilled. The problem is... She's going through her food too quickly, and she's starting to get really concerned about the fact that she might not make it till the end of the month. And as she's trying to ration out what little food she has left, that's when fake Leighton comes and visits her, saying, yeah, how's it feel? This is exactly what the tail had to deal with for years. And as fake Leighton is criticizing her, she hears a rummaging and goes to check it out, and she sees a rat, or at least what she thinks is a rat. She doesn't really know if her mind is playing tricks on her because it's pretty impossible to think that rats could have survived 150 below zero. But just in case it is real, she goes outside, cuts a little piece of the arm off that's outside, and sets up a trap for the rat. Then she just waits. And as she's waiting, her and fake Wilford start discussing the people that were found in the station dead. And Melanie's pretty sure that the woman and the guy outside were married because she saw it on a screensaver. With Wilford pointing out that the woman must have sacrificed the guy because he was sick, in order to get more food and rations. Wilford starts to paint the parallel of what Melanie did to her own family with Melanie defending the woman saying, well, what else could she have done? Melanie then hears something though and goes to check the trap and to her shock, there is in fact a rat inside of it. She even touches it to make sure it's real. And fake Leighton tells her about this recipe that he has for rat, but she says, no, I think I have a better idea. And she whips up a batch of paint and puts the rat inside of it and then lets it scurry off because she wants to follow this thing to see where it's going. And she follows it to a wall where she totally chip and Joanna gains this thing, ripping it apart. And when she peeks her head inside of it, there are a bunch of rats. Because behind this wall, there was a geothermal vent that nobody knew about. I mean, it's a minor miracle. And that's when fake Alex comes to visit her mom. And she's really the only one that's showing support for Melanie, telling her how awesome this is. They both start discussing how the rats must have come for the humans, but found the geothermal vent instead. And this geothermal vent had really kept the rats warm, and they just started banging their brains out, reproducing. But this is the food supply that Melanie's going to have to work with for the next three weeks. It'll also help with her energy supply. She had enough energy for one month, but with this geothermal vent, which will take away the power from the heat, and that'll help her database power. She starts telling fake Alex how she's planning on just walking to the train stop. She doesn't really have an option but she can't wait to get back on the train and be reunited with her daughter. The next day, she's waiting for the second-to-last balloon to connect, but the research center is hit by a really bad storm, and it completely knocks the radio tower over, destroying not only the radio tower, but also her database as well. And this is a big issue, because she still has about two weeks until the train is supposed to return. She's also got fake Wilfred mocking her during all of this, which is really stressing her out. He starts telling her how the mission has failed, but she says no, it hasn't failed yet. She then goes outside and hooks up a pulley system, to pull the tower back up, and she's able to do it. When she goes back inside, it works, because her systems all come back online. The last balloon connects, she's excited, she just has to wait for the results, and the train to come. And when Snowpiercer gets in range about two days early, she starts trying to radio Snowpiercer, but it's not working. She's not hearing anything. The day before, she does the same thing, doesn't hear anything. And two days after Snowpiercer was supposed to arrive, she's still coming up empty on the radio. She's losing energy, she's losing hope, And she decides to put a message to Alex, hoping that maybe Alex will hear it, apologizing, saying this time she really thought it'd be different. She thought she could make it back to the train. I mean, it's as broken as a Melanie Cavill we've ever seen. But then she starts to hear a rumbling and realizes, oh my god, it's Snowpiercer. So she starts running towards the train stop, but she realizes that the train is moving way too fast and needs to slow down. And she's radioing the train to tell them this, but they're not listening. Gets to the point where she has to ditch her gear and just run towards the train, But once again, the train doesn't slow down. It keeps flying by, and Melanie realizes, I'm not going to be able to get on this thing. And as the train does go by, she's able to see Alex in the back of Big Alice screaming, Mom. As just like Wilfred seven years back, she is left in shock because she is left behind. 
In episode 7, Leighton, Ruth, and Roach go to meet with Bach after everything that went down, and they realize that Wilford has to have somebody on their side of the train. Till knows that people are going to play in the tale, and she wants to make it right, and Leighton instructs her to prove that it wasn't the tale to get vindication for the tailies. Roach lets him know that they shut the border down, but they also know that it's only a matter of time before everything boils over. Pastor Logan is in there, trying to console Bach, Hands him a St. Christopher medal for protection and tells Till that he's going to take him back to the tea room and keep an eye on him. So Till heads off to try to prove that it wasn't the tale, while Leighton heads off to have Ruth fill him in on what happened with Miss Audrey. Zara points out that they still don't have access to Big Alice's comms and maybe she turned back to finish the job. But the fact is, this whole thing looks like a defection even if it isn't. So Leighton and Ben get in contact with Big Alice, and Wilford is reveling in the fact that they just dealt with eight murders. They ask to speak to Audrey, who is taking a bath, and when she shows up, they ask if she's okay, a.k.a. is he holding you against your will, and she says, no, I'm fine. They let her know, well, we'll open up the border for you since you missed curfew, but Audrey says, not yet, and Wilford shuts off the communication, not happy with her answer and telling her that wasn't good enough. She says, I stayed. Isn't that what you wanted? But he says, no, I want you with me. And I mean really with me. She tells Wilfred, you can trust me. But he pulls out a screwdriver and says, oh, can I? I found this. What is it for? Because what I think it's for is to mess with our comms so that they can listen in on our conversations. And she admits that that's what it was for, but she tells him, I didn't do it. And I also didn't stay to complete the mission. She stayed because of Wilfred. But he snatches her arm and says, I don't believe you. I want to show you something. Taking her shortly down the hall to where Sykes is standing guard of a locked door, and you can hear screaming coming from the other end. And right before they go in, Wilford informs Audrey that the person in there is a member of his crew, but they kind of lost their way. And when he opens the door, it's Kevin, who survived the suicide attempt. And as soon as Wilford walks in, Kevin is yelling at Wilford to just leave him alone. And Wilfred looks at Audrey and says, fix it, wanting her to work the magic that she worked in the night car on Wilfred. So Audrey tries to get to work, but after Wilfred hung up on them, Leighton, Ben, and Ruth realize that now they need to plan like Audrey isn't coming back. And the other issue is, while they want to get her back, they can't trust her. To make matters worse, the unrest that they were worried about has already started. Everybody in third class thinks that it was the tailies that killed all the breachmen. And because of this, a bunch of the tailies meet up and realize that they're all spread out. They need to get everybody back to the tail for safety. So the last Australian and z rec head up train and try to find any tailies that they can to let them know we got to get back. When While in third class, in walks Bach. And immediately the last Australian tells him, man, I didn't do this, but Bach doesn't care. He starts throwing the tailies around. And this results in Breachman and Bach getting arrested again, this time by Roach. And Ruth has met Bach and Roach down train to see what was going on. And Roach made comment, we never should have let him go with Logan. But Ruth's big concern is what's going on with the train. She asks Roach, how worried are you? Because we had order for seven years. And now we have this. And Roach tells her, we had order, but do you want to do that job again? Taking arms? Treating the tail like a gulag? And the answer is no. So they go and form Leighton as to what happened, and he realizes he has to address the train. And he does it, but he does a really bad job. He puts all the blame on Wilfred, taking all of the blame off of the tail, saying whoever did this wants to divide Snowpiercer. He urges everybody to remember, we're one train, we fought for this. But unbeknownst to him, his pitch is actually backfiring. People that fought with him are saying, we didn't fight for this. And all of a sudden, tailies are under attack. So when he's done, Ruth and Zara are waiting for him, and Ruth lets him know, I don't think that's going to go the way you planned. And Leighton tells her, I had to defend the tale. They don't have anybody else to speak for him right now. And she reminds him that bringing Wilford into this makes everybody pick a side. But Leighton did what he thought was right. Now, all the tailies are trying to get back to the tale, all but one, and that's Pike. He is messed up, and everybody can see it. He is casually just eating food, acting like nothing's wrong, when Leighton finds him, telling him, you probably should get back to the tail. But Pike says, no, I'm good right here, because I did the numbers and I checked the scale and everything's tipping towards Pike right now. He does, however, put on his headphones and start packing up, but he starts walking the wrong way and Leighton has to let him know, no, bud, the tail's that way. And Zara catches the tail end of this and Leighton tells her, I think I broke Pike. Leighton then goes to meet up with Till and Till has been on hot pursuit trying to figure out who orchestrated the attack. She has a clue and that's a button that she found at one of the murder scenes. So she hits up LJ and Osweiler to ask them if they have any idea about the button. And LJ doesn't give her the time of day. She doesn't even look at the button, just saying, no, I don't know anything about it. But Osweiler actually helps her, letting her know that there's a woman who sells antiques who probably knows all about it. So Osweiler takes Till to her, and the woman has basically a shrine to Wilfred. She used to know Wilfred when he was a child, so she watched him grow up into this powerhouse. And she also is well aware of what the button's from. It's from a jacket. But the jacket that she has has all the buttons on it. Her grandson, however, 
Let's Till know that they recently traded a jacket for a fur coat to a tall woman in first class. And Till knows exactly who that woman is. And it's Eugenia. So Leighton meets up with Till and Roach as Till confronts Eugenia about this accusation. And it's not a good look for Eugenia. She has a black eye that she's covered up with makeup, but the clincher is the fact that her jacket is missing a Wilford button. Right before she's arrested, though, she gets right into Till's face and says, you think you're so smart, but you're always two steps behind because this train needs change. The revolution is starting right now. And Till recognizes that phrase. She also recognizes the St. Christopher medal that Eugenia is wearing. So Till lets Leighton know, I'm pretty sure I know who orchestrated all of this, and it's Pastor Logan. But Eugenia isn't wrong. The civil unrest is getting worse and worse by the minute. It's even affected hospitality where Ruth and Zara are walking around when a bunch of people want to attack Zara because they recognize her from the tail. It forces Ruth and Zara to hide out in a medical car, where Ruth realizes that she's not in there alone with Dr. Pelton because there are a bunch of other tailies in there, like lights and the little girl Winnie. And when Winnie sees Ruth, she immediately hides in fear. And Ruth can't understand why, and Lights reminds her, it's because you took her mother's arm. It resulted in her mother dying. Her brother died in the revolution, and I'm all she has left, so she's terrified of you. And Ruth is kind of mortified about the fact that a child is scared of her. She asks Zara to call for an escort, and when he comes, he lets her know that it's not a great time to leave. It's still not safe. But as Ruth is trying to think about what to do next, everybody in the car realizes that Winnie is gone. She's stuck out. And Lights wants to go out there to find her, but Ruth lets her know, you can't. It's not safe. I'll do it. And Winnie was just casually walking around the cars, not realizing what was going on when she came across Pike. But then very shortly after, Pike was attacked by a bunch of people. He was actually kidnapped. And this caused Winnie to flee. She actually ended up hiding out in the same spot that LJ and Alex went to when they hung out the night of the party. And it doesn't take long for Ruth to find Winnie. But when she does, Winnie is still hiding from her. And at first, Ruth tries to tell her that you don't have to be scared of me, but then she feels like she probably should apologize. So she does that, telling her that it wasn't right that she took her mom from her so early and trying to commiserate with her, telling her, I lost my mom at a young age too. And eventually after this apology, Winnie does come out and Ruth is able to get Winnie safely back to the medical car. But as she's doing that, she runs into Leighton, who's running down train, And she asks what's going on, and Leighton lets her know they have a tailie as a hostage. So she drops off Winnie, and along with Leighton, the two both head down train, where the third-class passengers have Pike, and they're ready to freeze his arm. And Leighton steps in saying, whoa, you don't have to do this. Take my arm. You guys want me. I'm the one who did this. Go ahead. Sacrifice my arm. And even Pike tells him he doesn't have to do it, but Leighton's trying to be a leader. And the third-class passengers are more than willing to do that. They're fully ready to freeze Leighton's arm and smash it off. That is until Ruth speaks up, saying, We don't do this. That is your leader. And if you don't want him, enact change. But don't strip him down and mutilate him just because you can. Because trust me, you will never be the same again if you do that. This isn't the way. Not anymore. And Leighton is partly saved by that speech, but also because somebody comes in and lets him know that the brakemen are coming down train, so everybody flees. Although you get the feeling, this isn't over. Now, while all this is going on, Till went to go visit Pastor Logan, calling him on his bullshit, saying, was it all an act? I mean, you lied to me. He says, well, I never lied to you. You just weren't ready to hear the truth. You were so desperate for something to hold on to, something to believe in, and I wanted to help you. And she's kind of in disbelief and says, you killed eight people. But he says, that's a small price to pay for peace. You just have to suffer for a moment to get to our salvation. But Till's sick of listening to this guy and punches him, beating the crap out of him. He's only saved when one of his minions comes up behind Till and chokes her out. And Logan goes flinging in the next room. Till is able to free herself and beat up Logan's minion. And when she goes to arrest Logan, he's trying to commit suicide, hooking up a bag around his head to a tube connected to the outside. Basically, frostbiting his head. Till is able to stop it, but some damage is already done. He's alive, but his face is pretty badly frostbitten. And then finally, over in Big Alice, Audrey works all day on, quote, helping Kevin, showing him her suicide scar as well, trying to hammer home what Wilford was hammering home to her in the night car. The fact that Wilford, quote, saved her, or in this case, saved Kevin. Although Kevin doesn't buy that at all. But she keeps hammering it home, that he was useless without Wilford. He needed Wilford. Wilford saved him. And eventually, Kevin just breaks. When he does, Audrey escorts him into Wilfred's car, and to show Wilfred just how broken Kevin is, she instructs Kevin to lick his slipper, and Kevin does that. They then tell Kevin that he can kick rocks, and the two share a nice little kiss. It's a beautiful moment. But the best part of Wilfred's day comes at night. He even invites Alex in for this. As the train is circling this track, he's able to see a bunch of the other cars, and there are a ton of cars that have lit red lanterns, which is an indication we want Wilfred. And it's a sign that everything he did down in Snowpiercer 
getting those eight people killed, creating the unrest is working in his favor. And with this sign that people want him back, he tells Sykes, prepare Icy Bob. It's time. And Layton also sees it. And he now knows that he has a problem. In episode eight, Audrey is driving Alex nuts. She tries to kind of vent to Wilfred, but he isn't having it. She then brings up how she knows that Wilfred must be scheming something, but he tells her that if he's up to something, she doesn't have to know. She then brings up how there was an intentional breach of Big Alice in the morning, but Wilfred acts like he doesn't know about it, playing dumb the entire time. Now, after this conversation with Alice, Wilfred heads down into the infirmary to meet with Josie. And Josie is doing much better. Wilfred even shows her her reflection in the mirror to show her the improvement that she's had thanks to the Headwoods goo. And he's been told by the Headwoods that she's been dealing with phantom pain. So he has a trick for that that he shows her, all the while being extremely nice to Josie. He leaves her by telling her that he's no longer going to lock the door and welcomes her to Big Alice. So she heads out to grab some lunch and down walks Audrey. She introduces herself to Josie because the two have never met. And Josie asks if Leighton is still in charge of Snowpiercer, to which Audrey says, yeah, barely. Josie then realizes that Audrey must have defected. But Audrey says, no, I've returned. We've had very different journeys, but we both were leaders on Snowpiercer. We spent years being responsible for others, but now that we're here with all that weight, I've never slept better. Right before she leaves, she tells Josie, the future is yours if you want it. You just have to look in the mirror. She then heads up to the top of Big Alice, where she's looking for Wilfred, but all she finds is Alex, and it doesn't seem like their relationship has gotten any better. She asks Alex, where is he? Because he told me I should be here to see it. And when Alex asks, see what? Audrey tells Alex to turn around, and that's when she sees Icy Bob outside on the top of Snowpiercer coming back in. So Alex rushes downstairs just in enough time to see Bob return from the outside, and Bob is not doing well. And as the Headwoods tend to him, and Wilfred is overseeing it, Alex is questioning, why did you send him out there? Now, once Bob is invented to the infirmary, Josie goes to check on him, and he's in rough shape, and he tells her that he's just getting ready for his purpose. But one of the Headwoods comes over and lets her know about the advancements they've made, and Josie gets curious, and she checks it out, and she is blown away about the fact that thanks to that goo, She's not feeling the same effect she normally would have when she sticks her hand outside. But over on Snowpiercer, they were busy having a funeral service for all of the breachmen who had died. And it's a little concerning for Layton because during the funeral service, a couple of the brakemen throw up the W sign. He doesn't have much time to dwell on it though because he wants to meet with Bach along with Till and Roach. And they tell Bach the truth, that it was Pastor Logan acting as Wilfred who murdered all of the breachmen. But even with all the evidence in front of him, Bach doesn't accept it. He thinks that it's a taily sticking up for the tailies. But even after Leighton pleads with him to open his eyes, Bach doesn't accept the fact that Wilford would have his breachmen killed. So Leighton then holds a meeting with Zara, Roach, Dr. Pelton, Lights, and Till. This entire group is like the United Nations of Snowpiercer. And Leighton isn't oblivious to all of the Red Lanterns. He can feel the tide shifting on Snowpiercer. Lights brings up the fact that the tail can't even move freely anymore. They're back at the tail. And Till brings up the fact that half the train is brainwashed. The tunnel men are openly calling for Wilford's return. The good news is Pelton lets him know that most of second class still back Leighton. But as everybody's hemming and hawing, Roach says, don't worry guys, you have the brakeman. You can relax. And that isn't real comforting to Leighton because he saw some of the brakemen throw up the W sign, but Roach reminds him that that's a tradition for the breachmen. It's done as a sign of respect. He promises Leighton that the brakemen will hold their posts and they will follow Roach. But after this meeting, Roach has some family business to attend to. He's sending his daughter up train for safety, and she doesn't want to go, but with what's going on in the train and having already lost two children of his own, he feels like it's the smartest decision for his family. So after him and his wife say goodbye to their daughter, he fills his wife in on what's going on, about how divided the train is and how Leighton is trying to keep the peace, but the fact is they're one dirty look away from a civil war. And his wife brings up the fact that people are having a hard time believing that Logan was the one who had the breachman killed. It seems like even Roach's wife doesn't really believe it. Roach then goes to get a drink of water, but they're having plumbing issues. This little tiny leak ends up becoming a massive leak. It even starts setting off signals in the engine room, which Javi and Ben see, so Javi heads downstairs to investigate what it could be. As for the leak, well, Ruth has gone to check up on it, but Osweiler and LJ are already way ahead of her. They feel like this is their big opportunity to make sure that they don't lose their job in sanitation. If they do a good job, they clean up the leak, they'll keep their post. And they assure Ruth that they're going to clean up the job as fast as they possibly can. But that cleanup's going to take a little bit longer. Because as Javi is trying to figure out what's wrong, Ben lets him know that there's a pressure surge. And boy, is there ever, because a couple of pipes burst, and water just floods in his snowpiercer. 
So with this emergency going on, Ben calls Till, Roach, and Layton to fill him in on what's going on. There's a lot of technical mumbo-jumbo going on, but basically, one of the vents is just clogged with snow. And instead of converting water into hydrogen, the block is just causing the water to flood into Snowpiercer. Now normally, a jam like this wouldn't be that serious, but with only one breachman, it's pretty damn serious. Especially when you consider that that breachman doesn't seem like he really wants to help out Layton too badly. But Layton doesn't really have a choice. He's going to have to ask Bach to risk his life. So Layton and Till head downstairs and tell Bach that the train needs him. And he says, well, what if I say no? Layton tells Bach, look, man, I'm not down here giving you an order. It's your call if you want to do this. And after thinking a little bit, Bach decides, all right, time to go outside. So as the tunnel men are trying to get a handle on the blockage and Bach getting ready to go outside, Layton heads to the engine where they let him know that they're going to have to slow the train down, but this means it's going to be a two-hour late meeting with Mel for the rendezvous, the same Melanie that they haven't heard from. All the clearing of the snow, though, has gotten the attention of Alex from Big Alice. At first, she thinks that Bob might have been outside to disconnect the train. She's trying to figure it out because she realizes Snowpiercer has slowed down. So Wilfred says, why don't you just ask him? And she does that. She hops on the intercom, but Ben just tells her it's routine maintenance. The good news is Bach is ready to go outside, and he does that. He climbs down a ladder, and he's located the problem with the vent. It's a railroad spike that has been stabbed in there. And Bach is able to grab it. But he also knows that the railroad spike was no accident. First of all, all of the ice was broken off of the ladder, so somebody was there before him. And this is the moment where Bach realizes that Wilfred did in fact have the breachman killed. Because he's the only one who would have had somebody else go outside and sabotage the train. So he gives Leighton his Wilfred pin and tells him, maybe you can shove it up his ass one day. Pledging his loyalty to Leighton. There is a problem though. Ben tells Leighton to follow him and they head down to basically the engine's brain. They've been getting weird readings coming back and they realize that there's a sensor that is in the intake that must have been damaged when the real road spike went in there. And when they investigate it, sure enough, it is completely fried. Now, it's not that hard to replace. The problem is they don't have another one and this thing is vital to the train. If they don't have one, they're screwed. And Leighton has a pretty good idea of who has one and of course, it's Wilfred. And at this point, over at Big Alice, Alex has figured out why they were trying to vent and what Icy Bob was out there doing. What she can't figure out is what's next. And Audrey jokes with her, well, I think what comes next is a phone call. And sure enough, at that moment, Ben calls telling her that it's an emergency and they need help. Now, while Leighton and Ben and Javi were trying to fix the train, there's a lot of oblivious passengers in Snowpiercer. And that includes Ruth, who was just getting an update from LJ about the cleanup, and she's actually been really impressed with LJ's work. It leads to LJ and Osweiler hooking up that night. But Till and Roach are also oblivious, and they're meeting with the brakemen to go over a strategy to, you know, keep everybody safe. But some of the brakemen are concerned about their orders. Mainly, this rumor that's going around that the jackboots who survived the revolution have rebuilt a command. It's a rumor that neither Till nor Roach had heard of. But this conversation gets interrupted when Roach's wife walks in with sandwiches to give to everybody. And after everybody leaves... She has a conversation with Roach about the ongoings of the train because she's also kept her ears to the ground. And what she's been able to discern is that at this point, there's a lot more Wilford supporters than there are Leighton supporters. And it's also obvious that she's become one of those people. She thinks that they were just better off under Wilford's system. They spent seven years and everybody was fine. But Roach does not agree. He reminds her that Wilford built a train with holes in it to freeze off arms. Leighton, on the other hand, is a good guy who's trying to build a society that they can be proud of. Now, Roach is called to a meeting with Zara, Till, Ruth, Lights, Ben, where Leighton fills them in on the fact that they've discovered that it was Wilfred who was the one who sabotaged the train. And unfortunately for them, Wilfred is now their only way out. They know it, and more importantly, he knows it. The good news is Wilfred has a replacement, but he's going to have to come with it, and they only have two hours to fix this thing or else the engine collapses. Roach brings up the fact that this isn't going to be good for Wilfred's supporters once they find out that he's actually in the engine saving the day. But Leighton's already thought of that. He says, no one's going to find out. We're going to sneak him in. He's going to fix it. We're going to sneak him out. Zara is concerned about what Wilfred's planning. She doesn't like the fact that Leighton is letting him in the engine, but they don't have a choice. He reassures them that he's going to have eyes on Wilfred the entire time. And if it all goes to hell, he'll send up a flare to alert them. So they go to the tail to meet Wilfred, and he's a little surprised that no one is there to greet him except Leighton, Ruth, and Roach. But they put him in one of those carts in the tunnels, and as they're heading to the front of the train, one of the tunnel men ends up seeing Wilfred go by. So word is out on the train that Wilfred is there, and the tunnel men are scheming to keep Wilfred there. 
Wilfred, though, arrives at the front of the train and he's getting a little emotional about being back there. He heads downstairs into the engine where he meets with Ben, who he's not fond of, and Javi. He hands over the device and Ben and Javi start going to work, with Leighton making sure that he doesn't get anywhere near it. As they go to turn it on, something, though, goes wrong. Even Wilfred seems kind of concerned. He starts screaming, what the hell have you done to my engine? And that's when Ben remembers that Melanie had retrofitted everything during the Fifth Revolution. The engine is down to 14%. They don't have the reserves to restart them. They are in between a rock and a hard place. But Wilfred thinks for a little bit and then says, Big Alice can push us. We'll manually disengage the motors, and then that'll allow her to push with less resistance. We'll do an emergency shutdown of the engine. We then rewire the circuitry, and we jumpstart her back up. The issue is, that's over 200 manual shutdowns, and they're not even certain that it'll start back up. They've never done a shutdown this large before. They're basically shutting down all of Snowpiercer at once. But they don't have a lot of options, they're running out of time, so that's what they're going to do. Ben puts out an emergency alert letting everybody know that it's a code 5 and gets everybody in a position to restart the engines. And while Ben is doing that, Wilfred is getting in contact with Big Alice letting Alex know that she's going to have to push. Ben then gives the order for everybody to turn off Snowpiercer. But with little time to get this thing fixed, Wilfred kind of takes control, chastising Javi for not being quick enough chastising Leighton for not being an engineer, and then walking over to the intercom, grabbing it, and addressing all of Snowpiercer. It's Leighton's worst nightmare because this confirms that the cat is out of the bag, Wilfred is in the engine. And as over half of Snowpiercer rejoices at just hearing his voice, he lets them know that on his mark, they're to restart the engine manually. So they do that, and it works. And as Wilfred is restarting his engine, he's doing so the whole time smiling directly at Leighton because he knows that he's got him. And when Snowpiercer turns back on, most of the residences are chanting Wilfred's name. And Leighton knows that it's over, that Wilfred's got command of the train. So he just heads to the engine room and lights off a flare. And the Leighton supporters are crying because they too know what it means. That Leighton's time in charge of Snowpiercer has come to an end. Leighton actually gets arrested. And Roach comes to him and tells him that he's heading to Big Alice and he's been told that Leighton will be treated fairly. Although Leighton doesn't really believe that. Roach reassures him that he will do what he can to make sure that the tailies are protected during this whole thing. The biggest regret that Leighton has is the fact that he just wants to see his child grow up. And he's not sure that's going to happen now that he's being arrested and taken over to Big Alice. But before he does go, he is able to say goodbye to Zara. She's still working hospitality and she instructs him not to give up. He then is escorted over to Big Alice by security and the security lets Roach know that he is to report to Big Alice straight to Wilfred. But when Roach arrives over at Big Alice, it's not Wilfred who greets him, it's Audrey. And she escorts him into a room where the Headwoods are waiting for him to put him in the drawers. Because as he sees, his family is already hooked up. And the reason that Wilfred wasn't there to greet Roach is because he is at the front of the engine. Where Ben reluctantly has to tell him, Mr. Wilfred, you have the train. As Wilfred sits down in his chair, retaking the train that he created. Ever since Wilfred took over the train, things have been running pretty smoothly, but Ruth is seeing right through it because she realizes that it's basically Wilfred's martial law. She continues to run hospitality, but she's only confiding in a few people. Two of those people are Till and Zara. Ruth has been trying to gather information on Roach for Till, but she's been coming up empty. As for Leighton, she's been told that he's currently working in the compost area of Big Alice, which is a terrible job. It's so bad that they call it the swamp. But other than where he's working, there's no update on how he's doing. Till is pretty concerned because Wilfred has called for her, and she has no idea what it could be about, and she knows that Audrey has spoken to him, so she's worried that she might end up like Roach or like Leighton. Ruth attempts to calm Till's nerves by telling her that the biggest thing with Wilfred is to be something that he needs. Wilfred, though, has Ruth pretty busy planning this special party that night. There's going to be a random raffle for guests to have dinner with Wilfred, but he's putting all of that on Kevin. He tells Ruth that things on the train have been a little convoluted, so he wants a census done. This will help him split up the classes like he had it in the old days. Wilfred also hints at a big surprise that night, but when Ruth and Kevin leave, Ruth tries to get it out of Kevin, but he says, oh, I'm sworn to secrecy. They then walk into Dr. Pelton's office to find that Dr. Pelton's private medical files on all of the passengers have been confiscated. Ruth turns to Kevin asking, what is this all about? But Kevin is pretty sheepish about it and says, well, I guess Mr. Wilford's just seeing what everybody can contribute. 
Now, there's also a questionnaire that's going to go along with this census asking if you were a ticketed passenger, did you help with the rebellion, and none of this sits well with Ruth, but she has no choice but to bite her tongue. Now, the social classes aren't the only thing that Wilford is splitting up. He's also splitting up Javi and Ben, sending Javi to Big Alice, and Javi is kind of panicking. He feels like Wilford is just picking them off one by one, but Ben tries to calm him down, telling him that Wilford can't afford to lose another engineer. He also reminds him of the mission at hand, getting back to Melanie. And while it's true that they haven't heard from Melanie in 10 days, Ben reminds them that that's something Wilford doesn't know. So if they can just hold this out and get to Melanie, they'll be fine. Right before he leaves, though, Ben reminds him that they'll be monitoring every single little thing that he does, so just be careful. And then Javi heads to Big Alice, where he's met by Alex and a whole lot of attitude. Alex immediately tells him, don't touch anything, but Javi puts down a little Hawaiian woman figure and tells Alex that he thought she'd like it because he brought it over from Snowpiercer and it was her mom's. But it backfires. She yells at him, saying, don't try to butter me up. She then starts feeling the train, and Javi cracks up, saying, you know... When your mom came back from Big Alice, she mentioned how you had the touch and something that I don't have. But Alex isn't in the mood to talk to Javi, and she actually leaves him, telling him that she's going up train because it's a big day on Snowpiercer. Now, while Javi was getting reacclimated to his new role, Till had to go meet with Wilfred, and Wilfred tells her, you know, I really don't know what to do with you. And Till reminds him that eight of the breachmen were murdered, so she could start there, find the murderers. But he says, you know, train detective, that's a Melanie thing. I never needed it. You know why? Because there was no crime under me. But Till tells him, you can't be that naive. And Wilford whispers to her, and you can't be that innocent. She then asks for an update on Roach, saying that some of the passengers are wondering where he went. And Wilford tells her the truth. Roach and his family are in drawers, and they can come out when everything settles down. And that's a big surprise to Till, who tells Wilford that's not going to sit well. And he says... Oh, I'm aware, but I've got a surprise that will boost the spirits of everybody. He then instructs Sykes to take Till down to car 272, and car 272 has been closed for a long time. And the fact that it's being opened is the big surprise that Wilford was hinting at. And when Till gets there, it's this giant carnival car that's really made for kids. She's greeted by Ben, LJ, and Alex. And then in strolls Kevin, Ruth, and by Ruth's side is Winnie because they needed a kid. And this whole car is kind of Kevin's department. And while the Big Alice people are thrilled, the Snowpiercer people are pretty reserved about it. Till walks up to Ruth and gives her the update on where Roach is. But as they're having the conversation, Kevin instructs everybody to stand up because they're going to practice Wilfred's grand entrance. And he comes down dressed like Hugh Jackman in The Greatest Showman, but that's not the only surprise he has because he has some entertainment plan in the form of a puppet show. But the puppet show does not go over that well because the puppet show is about the journey on Snowpiercer, but more importantly, Melanie trying to, quote, save the world and dying in the process. And this does not sit well with Alex at all. And not just Alex, but anybody who is close to Melanie. So basically half the people in attendance. Ben calls it pathetic, saying, you can't just kill off Melanie with this propaganda. And Alex agrees with him, saying, we don't have this extra time, we're already a day late. But that's when Wilford reveals that he's actually known that they lost contact with Melanie 10 days ago. He discovered it through the doctored launch data. And this comes as a big blow to Alex, who had no idea. And it forces Ben to admit, yeah, we did lose contact with her. But don't give up hope, because Melanie's a fighter. I'm sure she's still there. Wilford then excuses everybody, sending Ruth to get ready for that night and handing out the tickets. But nobody's in that great of a mood. And one person who's going to be invited but wasn't at this practice run is Zara. So Kevin stops by to give her her ticket, but Zara is talking to Winnie because she's using Winnie as a message courier, telling her that she needs to get a message to Josie to find Leighton and Compost. They need to get an update from him, and it's important that it happens tonight because Wilfred will be busy. So Winnie takes off to get that message to Josie, who is pissed off at the Headwoods. She tells him that she didn't consent to be the female Icy Bob. And yeah, it's great that she looks better than she did when she showed up, but she demands to know what the hell they did to her body because she feels different. And the female Headwood says, well, before you get angry, when you put your hand in there and it didn't fall off, you felt a little bit of a rush, right? And it's something that Josie deep down knows is true. So they actually convinced Josie to not just put her hand in that tank, but her full body in, freezing her, just like Icy Bob, seeing how long she can last. Josie does eventually get Winnie's message and heads down to meet with Leighton, who sees that she's doing better. Josie then reminds him about what they're fighting for, a life outside of the train. She says, I can try to get you out of here, but he says, no, he's got a plan for you. Stay where you are. She admits to Leighton that she doesn't know what's going on with herself. She feels like she's being reborn. Right before their meeting ends, he tells her to keep faith in the others, they're still together, and that they will finish what they started. Josie, however, isn't the only visitor that Leighton gets that day. Wilfred stops by to gloat, 
Leighton is down in compost with not much to do but work. He has been able to stash a few items that have come through the chute. Minor things like a shard of glass that could be used as a mirror. But when Wilfred starts by, he just starts trying to needle at Leighton. But Leighton gives it to him right back, saying that he's nothing more than a white dictator with a train set. And the people that are under him will never love him like he wants them to. But Wilfred ends up winning this pissing contest when he brings up Zara. And that just sets Leighton off. Wilfred then leaves to get ready for that night, and Ruth has everything prepared, waiting to see the passengers. But when they arrive, Ruth quickly realizes that there was nothing random about this selection by Kevin. Because the guests are Till, Zara, LJ, Osweiler. And Ruth isn't the only one who's realized this, pretty much every guest has as well. LJ tells the group, no, I mean, I'm super excited. And Till turns to Alex and says, what about you? Are you super excited? And Alex says, no, I think we're all screwed. A short time later... Wilfred finally makes his grand entrance with Audrey, and they're yucking it up, but they're the only ones laughing. They all then sit down and eat with one empty seat that Ruth asks, should I clear? And Wilfred tells her, no, we're expecting somebody else. And this meal is pretty contentious. Zara starts it off by calling Audrey a whore for selling all of the secrets that she heard in the night car to Wilfred. Alex also gets in on the Audrey bashing. But the friendship between LJ and Alex withers away when LJ starts going in on Melanie. She tells everybody that Melanie lied about what she did on the train, and after LJ found out her little secret, Melanie had no choice but to reverse the verdict. But none of that really makes sense, and Wilford calls her on it saying, wait, so she had to reverse the verdict, which means you're guilty. And LJ starts trying to walk it back, but Osweiler actually comes to her defense, telling Wilford that LJ has changed. She's learned work ethic. She's a different person. And Wilfred turns his attention to Osweiler, asking, why should I even keep you around? And Osweiler gets up, goes down to the piano, and shows off a hidden talent that no one knew about as he plays and sings. And this makes Audrey a little self-conscious, who dismisses the whole thing. But when Wilfred turns his attention to Ruth, Alex warns her, don't believe anything he tells you. Because he has no intention whatsoever of going back and getting Melanie. And he admits as much, saying that he's not going to risk taking two trains on that track. She also asks Ruth, do you know what the census is for? Did he tell you what he did on Big Alice? Well, let me tell you, because originally on Big Alice, we had 200 people. But when he saw what kind of drain they all were, he started killing people, men, women, and children. And then Wilfred slams the table, yelling at Alex, how dare you make me relive that? He demands that Alex be taken to the brig, but right before she leaves, Alex turns to Ruth and says, Ruth, he's coming for you. Alex is then taken away, and Wilfred reveals to Ruth that the last sitting on the table is for her. So she sits down, and then he calls in Kevin. He explains to both of them that they had a great night, with the carnival being Kevin's, and this party being Ruth's, but there's a glut in hospitality, and there's only room for one person. And then he gives the job to Ruth. And she's relieved, but he tells her that in order to have the job, All she needs to do is address the train and tell them that they have no plans on going back for Melanie. And that is something that Ruth just cannot do. So as she's crying, she tells Wilfred that she's turning down his offer. And then she stands up, takes off the teal jacket, hands it over to Kevin, and is escorted over to Big Alice. After the party, Wilfred starts walking with Till saying, You know, I found out what job you can do. You can be my advisor. You can be my moral compass. You can show me where I go wrong. And then he opens a door and reveals a bunch of people hooked up to gas masks. He tells Till that these are the people that killed all the breachmen. And with one switch, their lungs will be filled with the air from outside. All Till needs to do is give the word, but she doesn't want to do that saying they deserve a fair trial. She reminds him that all of those people were acting on his behalf. And he says, yeah, well, pretty much everybody does. So she advises him not to do it. And he says, okay, well, then you should leave because you're not going to want to see this. And then he goes over and pulls the lever, killing everybody. But he didn't give Till enough time to actually walk out. So Till has to watch all of these people die. Wilfred then heads back up to the top of Big Alice where Javi is still in charge. But it's pretty awkward because there's an orgy going on. And it's pretty distracting to Javi. But during this key party, Javi faintly hears on the radio Melanie calling for Snowpiercer. He then, however, notices that Wilfred is walking towards him, so he shuts the radio off so he doesn't hear it. And Wilfred starts bashing Melanie, but Javi excuses himself to go to the bathroom because he knows he needs to get word that Melanie's made contact. So what he does is he writes a message on a piece of toilet paper and puts it in a lipstick tube and flushes it, hoping that it'll get down to Layton. But Layton isn't actually the one who finds it. It's Ruth. Ruth has been given the same job as Leighton, and she's pretty depressed about it. But when she finds the message, it gives her hope. 
And when she shows it to Leighton, he says, all right, Ruth, are you ready to get out of here? And finally, in the season finale, Leighton and Ruth have formed a plan to get out of the swamp, and it involves the guard who's outside. Ruth asks him for some more food, but when he sticks his hand through the little slot, they grab it. Leighton starts cutting him up, and finally Ruth just knocks him out with the shovel, and they're able to grab the keys and get out. They start trying to make their way through Big Alice to get to the engine, but it's really weird because nobody's out and about. And on their way to the engine, they just so happen to run into the brig, and they're a little surprised to see Alex there. They let Alex know that they've heard from Melanie. She's alive. They also let her know that they're planning on stealing Big Alice, and any assistance she could add would be appreciated. So she tells them that there's a secret entrance to the engine through Wilford's bedroom. She also mentions how they're crossing the Rocky Mountain test track that day, which means they're going to need both engines, which means that they're going to need Ben's help. Ruth then offers to get Alex out of there, but she says, no, Wilford wants me to kiss the ring. I can get out of here myself. So with this information, Ruth and Leighton head out, but it's not like life is going great for Wilfred. Audrey is in a stupor. He looks absolutely spent. And Till isn't exactly playing the game of advisor, telling him, well, you don't listen to my advice anyway, so I'm not your advisor. Wilford gets especially on edge when he finds out from Kevin that Zara isn't accepting food. And that's a pretty big deal because Zara is the only pregnant person on Snowpiercer. Alex, however, does her part. She calls for Kevin to bring her to Wilfred, and she bows down, apologizing for everything, saying that Melanie was a fool, everyone who followed her deserved what they got. And she even apologizes to LJ, who has been acting as a quasi-new Alex to Wilfred. She is, however, able to whisper into Till's ear that Leighton is coming and they're seizing the train. Now, at this point, Leighton and Ruth had made their way through the bedroom to the engine, but Javi's being guarded by two brakemen. So Ruth and Leighton quietly grab some weapons from Wilfred's private collection, and they bum-rush both of them. And Ruth pops her cherry with her first kill. They tell Javi that they got his message, but they need to get a message to Ben to make the turn on the Rocky Mountain test track. And the thing is, they don't have a lot of time because they're going to hit that track in about two hours. Ruth, however, gets pretty distracted when she finds Wilfred's tub, And since she's been in the swamp for a while, she smells pretty bad, so Leighton and her clean up. And now that they're all clean, they decide to form a plan with Javi on what to do. The issue is, just like how Javi had people on his back, Ben has the same thing. He's got a brakeman and Sykes. So it's not like they're going to be able to just radio to him and say, hey, flip the track. But Javi figures that he'll be able to covertly get a message to Ben because they worked together for seven years. So Javi's going to work on that, but they also need to work on getting Ruth and Leighton back to Snowpiercer. And the way they do that... It's to sneak Ruth and Leighton in a trunk that looks like it's destined for its carnival car. And they get through the border with absolutely no problems. And they arrive in that car where Bach, Lights, and z are all waiting for him. And Bach makes a comment about how he can't believe he's actually working with the tail, but Wilfred drove him to this point. Ruth and Leighton inform the group on their plans to take over the train, and they start making their way towards the engine. But they're not the only ones who are in on the coup. Because as Audrey is trying to talk some sense into Zara that she needs to play Wilford's game because Wilford doesn't really need her. Wilford can have the Headwoods just take her baby from her and kill her. There's a knock at the door, and it's Till, who knocks Audrey out, and they lock up Audrey as a prisoner. The good news for the group is that Javi was able to covertly get a message to Ben, so he knows he needs to switch the test track, but he has Sykes all over him. So he tells the brakeman that he needs to get some maps, but then he bum-rushes the brakeman, pushing him and then locking him out of the engine so it's just him and Sykes in there. He also grabbed the brakeman's baton, so he thinks that he has the edge on Sykes, but Sykes is a badass who beats the crap out of him. This may have actually been Ben's plan, though, because at one point, she punches him into the computer desk and he is able to switch the track over. And when the train switches over, it throws Sykes back and Ben is able to grab something and use it to knock her out. He chains up Sykes and then radios to Javi that it's done. They're going to pick up Melanie. A short time later, Ben receives a radio message from Leighton. Leighton's in a cold lock with Bach, and that's where they're planning on picking up Melanie. And Ben lets him know that they're about 10 minutes out. But the issue is they're on the test track, which isn't exactly a smooth ride. And the shaking of a glass piques the interest of Wilfred. But Alex, knowing what's going on, says, I'll radio the engine. And when she does that, she gets Ben on the other line. She makes it sound like, though, that everything's okay. When in reality, Ben is just telling her to hold Wilfred off. Now, initially, she's able to fool Wilfred, but she's not able to fool LJ, who says aloud that she's seen Melanie pull that trick, radioing the engine. And that's when Wilfred looks outside and notices that they are on the Rocky Mountain test track. Wilfred immediately jumps into action, saying that they need to seize both engines back, and he will command from Big Alice. He also tells the brakeman to escort Alex, but as she's walking out, she grabs a razor blade and puts it in her lip, just like Wilfred taught her. Wilfred then sounds an alarm, which lets Leighton and his group know that now Wilfred knows. And as the group is trying to hold off Wilfred, 
Leighton looks out the window and he sees Melanie walking towards the train. Unfortunately for Leighton's group, Fred has been able to cut his way into the engine as the brakeman beat the hell out of Javi. But Javi screams, you can't kill me, you need engineers. And Wilfred knows he's right, but he also wants to punish Javi, so he has his dog attack him and not kill him. Wilfred then takes control of Big Alice's engine, forcing it to speed up. And when this happens, Ben starts radioing to Javi to slow down, but Wilfred lets him know, nah, it's me, I'm back. You can try to brake all you want, but I have more momentum. And even though Ben is trying his best to throw the brakes on, the train goes right past Melanie, which leaves Alex in the window screaming for her. Alex begs Wilfred to turn the train around, saying that the people deserve to see what she found. But Wilfred screams back at her that Melanie's whole shtick was a fantasy, that people can't accept the fact that he saved humanity. He saved everybody on the train. He then goes in on Alex, saying that she was nothing more than a tool, something that he collected. And she returns fire, saying that he will never be the leader that Melanie was. The conversation then gets physical with Wilfred slapping her, and that's when Alex pulls out the razor blade and cuts him. Pretty badly on the neck. She doesn't hit an artery, though, but she does flee. Alex makes her way through the trains where she links up with Bach, Leighton, and Ruth, because she knows that there's a way to still save Melanie. And Alex's plan involves reconnecting a couple of cars from Snowpiercer, going back, picking up Melanie, and then heading up track to reconnect. They'd be able to do this through the aquarium, which has a manual override. And if they did that, they'd have a 10-car train. And a 10-car train can outmaneuver Big Alice because Big Alice is pretty slow. So as that group starts to go forward with this plan, Wilford had to head to the Headwoods to get patched up. And he's in a really bad mood. And Josie is watching Wilford get patched up from the second floor. At this point, Josie's kind of accepted the fact that she is the female Icy Bob. And while at first she felt violated, she wants to test herself. She wants to test the limits. But Wilfred gets a glimpse of her, calling her Icy Woman, and instructs her to go outside on top of the train, make her way to the engine, break through it, freeze Ben, and reclaim Snowpiercer for Wilfred. The Headwoods warn him, however, that she's not ready for that, but he screams, then why did we make her? Take her to the hatch and lock her outside. If she wants back in, her way back in is through the engine. So since he's the boss, the Headwoods strap up Josie and take her to the hatch. Leighton, however, had headed to fill Till and Zara in on the plan, and initially they're not big fans of it, but Till is able to get on board. Zara, however, does not. She tells Leighton that she's better off there with the devil that she knows than the devil that she doesn't. Besides, you're going to need me here when you come back. So they say their goodbyes, and Zara stays with Audrey, their hostage. Leighton then heads up train to hold off Wilford and his men as long as he can. Breachman Bach is underneath, trying to override the system, and Ben is still running the engine, but he gets a notification that somebody opened up the hatch. And Sykes says, oh yeah, that must be Wilford's icy woman that he's been making, that former Taylor, and she's coming to take the engine and kill you. But Ben is well aware of who Josie is, so he radios to her, telling her that he's working with Leighton, he's running the train, and he needs her help. Leighton, however, is having a tough time holding off Wilfred. He's made it all the way to the aquarium, where he tells Wilfred that they're going back for Melanie and Wilfred ain't coming with. And that's when Till brings out the hostage, Audrey. Leighton tells Wilfred that she's the guarantee that Zara stays safe. But Leighton is totally unaware of what's going on beneath his feet with Boki, who is run up on by a bunch of brakemen. And he's putting up a good fight, but he's way outnumbered and he's unable to manually override the train. And Wilfred knows this, so he's gloating to Leighton that he was just never going to let him take the train. And when Leighton tries to say that he'll kill Audrey, Wilford just laughs at him, saying, that's not who you are. But that's when they hear a banging from up top, and it's Josie, who is using the tool that she was supposed to use to break the engine, but instead, she's breaking the aquarium. And she's able to puncture it, with all the water freezing up quickly, and basically forming a sort of bomb. The people that were on the engine side fly back that way, and the people that were on the Big Alice side fly back that way. The whole aquarium disintegrates. And it's not pretty, but it works. The train ends up getting uncoupled. Leighton's group then heads back to pick up Melanie with Leighton and Alex agreeing to go out to get her. They make it all the way to the research center, but they don't find Melanie. Instead, they find the data and the drives, and Alex finds a note from her mom. At this point, Alex is bawling her eyes out as she reads the note from Melanie telling her that after the train went by, she knew that there was nothing left for her. She used up all the resources, she ate all the rats, and yes, yeah, she could have kept the power on for a few hours to keep herself warm, but a better idea was to keep it on a very low heat to save the drives. That way, they would have been preserved for months. She knew that when the train went by and Snowpiercer was breaking and Big Alice was pushing, that Wilfred had intervened. At that point, she decided to just walk out into the snow. She finishes the note by telling Alex that she is her hope. 
and to learn to love the people that got them this far and to build a better world. So Leighton and Alex return to Snowpiercer and they load up the drives and it worked. All the research that Melanie collected is right on their computer screens and they're able to see all the hotspots in the world that they can start to rebuild a colony. Leighton, Josie, Ruth, Ben, Alex, they're all just marveling at the work that Melanie did. But that's when Leighton says, all right, let's go get our train back. And that is the end of season two of Snowpiercer. Man, what a season. Thank you so much for getting to the point of this video. Do me a favor. If you like what you saw, hit subscribe. If you don't, you know, I mean, keep moving, I guess. Uh, hit thumbs up uh, or thumbs down if you thought this sucked. But please be nice in the comment section. You don't need to point out every little mistake you found. This video is like four hours long. Mistakes are going to happen. Like sending Josie out there to get the train back for you. See, that was a mistake. It happens. But just know I really do appreciate you guys checking this video out. And listen to my podcast, Scene Invaders, if you want my thoughts on actual things.